Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is June 8th, 2022, and the time is 9.30. Uh, today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. Uh, there are a couple of different ways for everybody to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it's recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. And to call in, please dial 1-669-900-6833. And then when prompted, enter your collaboration code. The number for that is 814-8152-8029. And that number is also posted on our webpage. Uh, during key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Uh, speakers will be muted until called on to speak. And I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony either remotely raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone, by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone. I will then call participants either by your name or by the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on the phone. Uh, when you do this, you'll be given three minutes to speak. Um, if at any time you have difficulty connecting today's meeting via the Zoom link or by calling in via telephone, please email Michael Lamb at michael.lam, and that's spelled L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. He'll be checking my email periodically throughout the meeting, and so he's on standby ready to assist you. So, okay, it appears that we're situated, so I'll now turn everything over to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Chair Gordon. Good morning, Ms. Jess. Thank you for the intro, and we are glad to have you today. And um, looking forward to this hearing. Today is June 8th and uh, we can open this at, excuse me, at 9.32, and we can call this meeting to order. Could we please have a roll call, Ms. Jess? Yes. All right, Commissioner Dan. Here. Commissioner Schaefer Freitas. No. Commissioner Shepard. Commissioner Shepard. You're muted. Yeah, she's Shepherd. muted. Commissioner Shepard? I'm here. Yes, yeah. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lazenby? Here. And Chair uh, Gordon? Here. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much. With that, we can move on to agenda item number two here, additions and questions to the agenda. Do we have any today, Ms. Jess? Uh, yes. Item number seven. Uh, which was a public hearing of uh, an ap application 171213 has been um, taken off the agenda. It's been re-noticed and rescheduled for June 22nd. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, moving on to agenda item number three, declarations of ex parte communications. Do you have any um, uh, declarations by any of the commissioners today? Okay, great, thank you. We'll move on to agenda item number four. This is the oral communications. This is time when members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. Uh, Ms. Jeffs, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak at this time? Um, I'm not seeing anybody at this point. Let me hang on, 23. I'm not seeing any hands raised at this point. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, Chair Gordon. Yes. I forgot to say, I have talked to staff about the sustainability draft. I'm not sure if I need to, that's ex parte, but I better Understood. can't hurt to say so. Absolutely. Understood. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, then uh, 
seeing no um, members of the public that would like to speak at this time on agenda item number four, we can close that and move on to agenda number five, consent agenda item AB 361 resolution. We know it well. Uh, are there any commissioners I'd like to make a motion and a second on this item? I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. See Commissioner Lazenby staying there. I'll second. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a motion and a second. At this time, we can just take a vote. And all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? And okay, hearing none, the motion passes. And we can move along. Agenda item number six, approval of minutes from the May 25th Planning Commission meeting. Um, do we have any commissioners I'd like to make a motion on this item? I'll move approval. Thank you. I'll second. And a second by Commissioner Lazenby. Then we can go ahead and take a vote on this matter as well. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, hearing none, we can move the motion along and close that item. At this time, we are going to get to the meat of our agenda item today, and it's uh, item number six, or excuse me, I'm looking at the minutes. It is item number eight. A study session to consider the sustainability policy and regulatory update. Um, do, you see, do you see? I would like to give a quick update here, or just kind of talk through the process today. This is the second in a numerous series of study sessions that we're going to look at the new sustainability update. Um, you know, not really sure how long these might take. So if we get to 11.30, we'll need to take in a, a 30 minute lunch break. And so if we uh, see that time coming, we can just all expect that. Um, today's process will go as follows, similar to last week. We're gonna hear a presentation from planning department staff. Then we'll bring it back to the commission for initial questions and, um, you know, hope to move really quickly to public comment to let members of the public speak before we really dive in to um, our, our major discussion. After public comment, we'll have you know time for the commission to have final discussions on this topic. There's no action needed today. It's informational only. And so that being said, uh, Ms. Jess, do we have members of staff available for a report at this time? Well, Ms. Jess, I believe you're muted. All right, so I, um, today we have Stephanie Hansen, who is the principal um, assistant planning director in, who's gonna be um, presenting on this item. And she is already available to talk. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Lizanne. Can you all see me? Oh, wait a second, I'm being... <laughs> hear you, can't we see can you. hear you, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Can you see me and hear me now? Yes. And yeah, good morning. Great. Thanks. It took a second to get elevated there. Um, with me today also is Annie Murphy. She'll be presenting today. Could you elevate her as well, please? I believe she's, uh, there we go. There she is, okay, great. And I think we'll need to unmute. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen. A couple here, so. Okay. Can you all see that first slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
it's hard to tell when you're sharing. <laughs> okay, uh, so good morning, commissioners. Um, today, uh, we have a presentation for you. We'll be discussing the sustainability policy and regulatory update. Um, uh, my name is Stephanie Hansen. I'm the uh, one of the assistant directors in the new community development and infrastructure department. Annie Murphy, senior planner, um, will also be presenting with me this morning. This presentation, as Tim mentioned, is the second in a series of study sessions on this project. Um, today, we're going to focus on the built environment, community design, and um, amendments to the general plan and uh, zoning maps. <clears throat> Okay. For today's study session, we'll begin with a review of the overall development framework um, that's in the project, and then we'll move on to the details of the proposed policy and code changes for residential land, also reviewing how new design guidelines help to shape residential development. Um, we'll then pause the presentation, I think, because there's a lot of material here today um, so that the commissioners can ask some questions on the material they've seen so far. Um, uh, and it'll be an opportunity for targeted discussion on residential development. Um, then we'll move on to commercial and industrial development, and um, we'll have an optional break in there for any questions from the commission, um, or we can just move on at that point. And then we'll review the zoning map amendments um, and general plan map amendments and conclude with the project schedule and then head into questions and comments from the commission and the public. So we'll start out with kind of defining what the built environment is as it's anticipated in the project. And broadly speaking, these are areas of our communities that are developed with buildings, roads, and infrastructure. In today's presentation, we're going to focus on policies and standards related to buildings and building sites in residential, commercial, and industrial districts. In study session number three on June 22nd, we'll review aspects of the built environment that's related to transportation and public facilities, as well as parks. Policies related to development on agricultural land specifically will be covered in the July 13th study session. Chapter two of the built environment has been renamed from land use to, uh, excuse me, of the general plan has been renamed from land use to the built environment element. And this provides the main policy basis for the built environment. In this chapter, you can find policies regarding the county's overall development framework, as well as policies for residential, commercial, and industrial development for building and site design generally. Um, as we mentioned in the first uh, study session, environmental justice is a new important topic that's required for general plans. And this chapter incorporates many of the county's environmental justice policies, including those for disadvantaged communities. The county code implements these built environment policies. Chapter 1310, uh, which regulates land uses and building types are allowed in and what's allowed in each zone district and provides development standards, such as building height and setbacks that dictate what form buildings may take. Um, also today, County Code Chapter 1311 provides design standards and requires site development permits and design review for certain project types. This chapter is closely linked with the new county design guidelines which provide best practices for the design of buildings and sites to support sustainable and context appropriate infill development in the urban areas. In certain areas of the county special plans also apply to development. No changes have been proposed to these existing plans. The guiding design principles for the Pleasure Point Commercial Corridor, reflecting the 2018 Pleasure Point um, Commercial Corridor vision and guiding principles from um, are being adopted as part of the county design guidelines. These are Appendix B in the guidelines. A 
objective standards for commercial properties in the corridor are also provided in the commercial regulations in the SCCC, the Santa Cruz County Code. So moment on the development framework, just to kind of set the stage here, um, our framework for Santa Cruz Co County focuses on development within our existing urban areas, providing natural resources, or excuse me, preserving natural resources in rural areas. This development pattern makes efficient use of our urban land in order to reduce the need to expand urban services and infrastructure beyond the urban and rural services lines, which have been in place since the passage of Measure, Measure J in the 1970s. The sustainability update continues to reinforce the importance of those lines with built environment policies and regulations that focus growth within the USL and RSL. The map on this slide shows land within the county's urban services line shown in the dark blue line spanning from Live Oak to Rio Del Mar. Soquel Avenue is the dominant commercial corridor shown in light blue with a series of employment and commercial centers surrounded by residential neighborhoods. In Live Oak, commercial centers and residential neighborhoods are shaped by an intersecting pattern of roadways leading to the coast and also to destinations such as the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Capitola. Key corridors in Live Oak include 17th Avenue, Capitola Road and Portola Drive, which is shown in pink. Other Main Street corridors include Seacliff Drive, Porter Street and Main Street in Soquel and 41st Avenue north of Portola. The sustainability update plans to accommodate growth primarily around these key corridors. This development framework allows for coordinated development of the built environment with improvements to tran transportation infrastructure that can support this development. Buffer areas near key corridors represent focus growth areas, which are shown in light purple on the map. This is where higher density development may be appropriate due to infrastructure and services. The sustainability update framework also aims for services and amenities to be located within a 15 minute walk from home for urban county residents. Now, Annie is going to uh, lead us through a discussion of the residential development policies and standards. Thank you, Stephanie. Santa Cruz County, like much of California, faces a housing crisis, both in terms of supply and affordability. Addressing the housing crisis is key to ensuring a sustainable, livable, and equitable future for our community. Over the past 30 years, policies and zoning standards have largely favored the construction of single family dwellings on large lots and very few multifamily housing units have been built. Single family dwellings are increasingly out of reach to all but the wealthiest residents. In the first quarter of 2022, only 13% of households in the county could afford to purchase a median price single family dwelling requiring an annual income of $282,000. Single family dwellings on standard size lots also limit the housing supply as they require a large area of land per dwelling, further driving up costs. For rental housing, Santa Cruz County residents currently need to earn about $48 per hour, which is 3.2 times the state minimum wage to afford the average monthly rent of $2,500. Currently in the county, there's also a mismatch between the size of dwellings and household size. While 26% of the households in our community are single person households, only 17% of the units are one bedroom or studios. To address this housing crisis, New policies support more housing choices to ensure housing is available to residents of all household sizes and incomes. An additional goal is to support infill housing, which is additional housing within existing neighborhoods and in urban areas where services are available. This will be accomplished by ensuring that policies, development standards, and project reviews support economically viable multifamily projects. The review process for development projects will be discussed at the July 13th study session. Policies supporting infill development in urban areas also ensure the continued preservation of open space and natural resources, support walkable neighborhoods, and help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
New policies also support the development of higher density projects with compact units and more overall floor area on a site or higher building intensity in areas near transit and services. An additional goal is to ensure that the county can meet our Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA, which is the total number of housing units and affordable units our county must plan for in our next housing element cycle. The county anticipates a significant increase over previous requirements. The sustainability update sets the policy and regulatory framework to enable the county to meet our housing obligation. Accommodating our six cycle RENA obligation will be addressed directly in the county's next housing element update. The primary strategy of addressing the housing crisis is to support the development of a variety of housing choices, increasing the number of housing units and expanding the types of housing available. The county is especially lacking smaller units for singles, seniors, and students, as well as other multifamily housing options. One new category is small lot single family. The county is allowing smaller single family lot sizes with compact residences. The photo in the upper left shows an example of this housing type. Missing middle housing, such as accessory dwelling units, townhouses, duplexes, condos, and small apartment buildings, increase housing choices for the community at more affordable price points. Thoughtfully designed and at an appropriate scale, missing middle housing can blend into existing residential neighborhoods and contribute to neighborhood character. The photo on the upper right shows a small apartment building within a residential neighborhood. There's also a need for multifamily housing at various densities throughout the county, including apartments and condos. Pippin Orchards on the lower right is a recent example of an affordable apartment project in Watsonville. And the photo on the lower left shows the Swan Lake Gardens condominium complex in Live Oak, an older housing development. Policies and regulations will also support higher density projects in areas near transit and urban services. The county establishes the allowable number of housing units per acre on residential land or residential density by designating land in urban areas as very low, low, medium, and high density. Allowable density on each parcel is determined by the implementing zone district, which establishes the minimum land area required per unit. Lower density ranges apply in rural areas, helping to preserve rural character and natural resource. Uh, the table on the slide only shows our urban designations, and we're not proposing any substantive changes to rural densities or rural development standards. Current density ranges for urban areas are very low compared with other communities, currently topping out at 17.4 units per acre in urban high density. This discourages the construction of more affordable multifamily housing options, such as apartments and smaller units, and further constrains the potential for housing that meets community needs. In comparison, the city of Santa Cruz supports densities of 30 to 55 units per acre in high density zones. The county is proposing several changes to urban residential density to support infill development on multifamily housing. One change is to use the entire parcel area to determine allowable density, called the gross site area, instead of first deducting unbuildable areas such as rights of way, known as net developable area. Using gross site area to calculate density will encourage urban development to achieve established densities provided in the general plan and simplify project review. As shown in this table in the green text, the sustainability update also simplifies and slightly expands the density range for urban very low, low, and medium designations. Uh, however, since the actual density for these projects is established by the minimum land area required for dwelling in the zone district, this change would not increase allowable densities on existing parcels with these land use designations. The urban high residential designation would increase from 17.4 to 30 units per acre. This change would allow for the creation of new parcels in the existing RM 1.5 district, which allows up to 30 units per acre, and the RM 2 zone district, which allows up to 22 units per acre. This provides a path for new multifamily residential development at a density that supports apartments and compact units. Existing general plan densities do not allow for the creation of new parcels in these districts. To address the missing higher density range for residential development, 
we will also be creating a new urban high flex land use designation and a corresponding new residential flexible or res flex zone district with densities up to 45 units per acre. The purpose of the new urban high flex land use designation and implementing res flex zone district is to support the development of compact units that are more affordable by design. This zone district is a tool that provides an efficient use of land, allowing more housing units to be provided within the limited land available in the urban area. Less land is required per unit and development standards encourage compact unit sizes that are generally more affordable. Less flex units are appropriate near and along key corridors where transit and services are available, located near major employers such as Dominican and near colleges, including Cabrillo. The zone district provides a new higher density range of 22 to 45 units per acre. Based on recent multifamily housing projects in the county, we would anticipate that most market rate projects would be constructed at a density of around 22 to 26 units per acre, and projects with more than 26 units per acre would generally be provided by nonprofit affordable housing developers. The zone district will encourage 100% affordable projects at higher densities that would provide affordable housing so desperately needed in our community, as well as compact one bedroom and studio units appropriate for smaller households. Although the urban high flex land use designation and the RF zone district is new, the zone district reflects the development density of many existing apartment and condominium complexes in urban areas of the county on both small and large sites. These projects were constructed under previous zoning standards that facilitated multifamily housing. All of the examples on this slide are located in the county and fall within the urban res flex density range. Uh, can you advance to the next slide, please, Stephanie? <clears throat> Um, although these multifamily residences were constructed in prior decades and do not follow the new design guidelines or proposed development standards, it is apparent from these examples that the housing at these densities can integrate well with the existing neighborhood fabric through design features, appropriate massing and scale, and can include significant open space. From the exterior, it is in fact difficult to determine the density of any particular example. Um, as you can now see, uh, density ranges for these multifamily residences and condos range from 26 units to 38 units per acre, falling within the density range of the RM1.5 zone district and also the density of the new Res Flex zone district. To support more housing choices, the county is also revising residential development standards for higher intensity development. Key changes to development standards are shown in the table in green. For single family parcels, the minimum lot size has been reduced from 3,500 to 2,500 square feet to allow smaller single family lots with compact residences for future land divisions, providing for more efficient use of urban land. Updated development standards also facilitate development on smaller single family lots. Standards for the lower density residential multifamily or RM parcels are generally not changing. However, to support development of projects at the upper end of the RM density range uh, from 11 to 29 units per acre, revised standards allow for increases in floor area ratio or FAR, which regulates bulk and mass on a site and allow increases in lot coverage, which is the portion of the site that can be covered by structures. Three stories and 35 foot height limits would also be allowed for these higher density RM projects, which can allow for additional open space and landscaping and provide space for parking. While supporting multifamily housing at these higher densities, development standards continue to regulate mass and bulk, with standards also acting as a check on the average unit, unit size to support reasonably sized units and discourage large luxury units. Residential parking standards are also being revised which will be reviewed in detail at the next study session on June 22nd. The project also retains multifamily development standards, which provide for compatibility with the neighborhood context and single family neighborhoods. This includes maintaining existing 15 foot front yards setbacks and uh, the existing interior side setbacks. 
open space requirements for residential multifamily districts have been clarified, um, lowering the open all, overall, open all, overall open space area required in some sites and including minimum dimensions for open space areas to ensure the areas are usable. For the new uh, ResFlex zone district, special standards are proposed to allow the higher intensity development necessary to support additional compact units. This includes heights up to 40 feet and three stories and reduced front yard setbacks and increased floor area ratio. Open space is required for ResFlex development with a minimum of 10% of the lot area devoted to open space, which may be public or private open space or a combination to provide design flexibility. Requiring open space as a percentage of the total site area facilitates development on RF sites while continuing to provide needed open space for residents that ensures livability and quality design. Development standards in the county code, along with chapter 1311, site development and design, provide objective standards that work in conjunction with the new county design guidelines to ensure quality projects that are compatible with the surrounding context. The design guidelines apply within the USL and RSL to multifamily development of three or more units and to commercial and mixed use development. These guidelines provide best practices for the design of building and sites to ensure functional and attractive designs and provide for gathering places, active and attractive street frontages, quality open space and landscaping, and green building and site design features. The guidelines provide a flexible approach, allowing for creativity and diverse architectural styles that meet design goals. The guidelines provide overarching guidance as well as guidance specific to different land uses, including multifamily development and mixed use, as well as commercial. As seen in the slide, the design guidelines includes diagrams of sites and building elevations and perspective drawings with photos illustrating these design concepts in various ways to meet the design objectives. <laughs> guidance for the design of multifamily sites ensures that multifamily projects respect the scale, style, and character of the existing context. Parking is required to be located in the rear or mill of the site when feasible to maintain residential character and provide an attractive streetscape. Landscaping and trees are required within front setback areas contributing to the urban forest. Required open spaces encouraged within front setbacks contributing to neighborhood character and projects in residential neighborhoods are encouraged to complement existing front yard depths. Special design guidance is provided for multifamily de development which includes uh, ResFlex sites to ensure compatibility with adjacent sites. Recognizing that adjacent properties may include one and two story buildings, development standards require that 50% of any third story be set back an additional five feet from the uh, required property setbacks. The design guidelines further help to reduce the appearance of height and mass and provide additional privacy and transition to neighborhood properties. The guidelines encourage locating taller portions of the building in the center of sites, include other design techniques, such as tapering heights down to the property lines, using pitched roof and changes in roof and wall heights as appropriate to the design style and surrounding context. Consistent with environmental justice goals, the same design principles apply to ResFlex sites as to other multifamily housing. Special guidance is provided for RF sites where appropriate such as techniques for building modulation, guidance tailored to the street type, such as housing along multimodal corridors and special recommendations for open space. For buildings, design principles are intended to maintain a human scale. Varying wall planes help to identify individual buildings and break up larger buildings. Design details such as varied building materials, balconies and awnings add further interest and character. Using these very design approaches, one can often not tell from the street how many dwellings are in a particular building, as each building can read as a single family dwelling. For example, the buildings in the top illustration on the right could be individual townhouses or could include separate units on each floor. This is also true for the buildings in the photo on the top left. In the photo of the blue building on the lower left, could easily be a larger single family dwelling 
but in fact includes four separate units. Now we'll take a um, pause and provide time for questions and comments from your commission on the residential uh, changes. Great, thank you both for that presentation so far. Appreciate it, um, a lot of information. Would any commissioners like to uh, start with some questions, some Q&A or discussion on these topics to start with? I apologize, I can't see quite everyone here. So just go ahead and speak up. Do we have members of the public here wanting to speak? Thank you. Oh, you're um, muted, Suzanne. I think one thing that uh, Ms. Hansen mentioned was that we would, well, let's talk about that. We were talking about potentially getting members of the public in sooner, but we only have one opportunity for them to speak. Um, Ms. Hansen, was your plan to do that later at the end? Yeah, our, we thought we would just, since it's so much material, take a break for any uh, questions from the commission right now, and then op at the end, open it up for public comment. That, that's how we had thought it might work. Okay, thank Obviously, you. Obviously, there's flexibility. Uh, I had sure. a question. Maybe uh, one sec here, Commissioner okay. Shepard, please. Let's just figure out this process really quick, and then we'll move forward. Um, I think then if we can try to minimize questions as a commission until we get to that point, you know, questions that are specific to this section, if that's appropriate and feels good for the rest of the commissioners, I'd, you know, say we can move forward with that so we can get to the uh, public comment portion sooner. That's fine with me. I have a number of, of questions, but it doesn't matter when the, the um, waiting is fine. Okay. I don't, I don't agree. I need to, I would like to ask my question. This is a huge document. I'd rather ask my questions as she finishes each section. I'm I'm happy either way, just trying to get some input from everyone. So, if, you know, we want to just dig in. I'm happy to do that. I think a lot of our questions will inform the public, but I also don't want them to have to sit around all day to give us their comments. So well, hopefully some of our questions will answer questions the public has. Sure. So yeah, please. Um, well, I think Commissioner Dan was probably first in line. Did you have okay. anything in particular? Uh, no, Renee is uh, welcome to, to go first, please. Okay, okay well, you. I just have a general question. Um, if this were a giant project, we would, you know, I know that environmental review has been done, but I, I have a very general question and I'll only ask it once through the whole process, which is um, this, I think a lot of these housing changes are, are well-constructed, a good idea, and I think we should go ahead with them. But I have to say, have we looked at how much water we have and how much congestion it's going to cost, cause at all? Because I had another experience of trying to go to South County yesterday, and it took me an hour. So if we build, are we looking at what this will mean in terms of congestion and traffic and do we have the water resources to build out? Have we looked at what this can mean if it was successful? And I have to ask that because it's the elephant in the room. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. I'll take a first stab at that. Um, the environmental impact report for the project, um, which we'll go into more in uh, the study session on July 13th, um, does look at all of the elements required by CEQA, including traffic and um, water and other public facilities, as well as all the other elements. Um, the EIR is a program EIR, so it's looking at the, the big picture countywide, um, but it does make assumptions for how much growth could be accommodated in the 20 year planning horizon for the project. And it does find that there are some significant impacts, which we'll review in detail. Um, and these certainly include um, water supply. Now, we can talk a little bit more about that, but the sustainability update <clears throat> is anticipating uh, more uh, intense development in the urban areas as we've been discussing. And 
Um, when we did our forecasting, we found that um, amid this middle of the road approach um, uh, resulted in more units than has been anticipated by AMBAG's uh, growth projections for the region and for the county. Now, those projections are very low. Um, the county has not been growing very much. Um, in fact, we've, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but in recent years, we've been, um, we've had negative growth. Um, and as you know, because when you review the growth goal, we're talking about, you know, 0.25% growth in the, in, for the next year or growth in residential units. It's been really low. So we do in, Anticipate not only with this project, but also with all of the um, uh, bills that the state legislature has been passing to try to uh, increase housing, increase infill housing, um, and streamline housing. That at some point, growth, if we can actually build some of the housing that we need for this community, we anticipate our growth will be a little closer to what we've proposed rather than AMBAG. And AMBAG will have to <clears throat> adjust their um, projections to really look at the 33,000 units that the state has told us we have to have in the next arena. So there's a little bit of a disconnect. And the reason why I bring that up in particular is because the, um, the EIR does look at water supply, the water districts do their own projections um, so that they can tell where they're going to have a shortfall in water supply. Those are based on AMBAG's numbers. And so, as I said before, we're, we don't think AMBAG's numbers are really going to be realistic as new housing development um, takes place and uh, communities try to meet their arena. So there is, um, because we do exceed the projections done by the water districts in their forecasting, we find uh, that there could be a significant impact associated with development over time. However, um, we think that the water districts are um, have plans for addressing the sustainability of their uh, water supplies, and they have multiple projects that are planned for over time to try to both conserve and increase uh, storage, which leads to greater reliability and supply. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a changing scenario, but the EIR does look at it in, in, in detail. Long explanation, I apologize for that. Well, I understand the explanation. It's a good explanation, but I almost think that since we passed the growth control measure all those years ago, we've never met the growth numbers that were allowed. So it's, so it's become a somewhat, I think it's an important piece of legislation, but it's somewhat irrelevant because we've never exceeded the number of allowable permit numbers ever. And yet congestion and traffic from North County to South County and back have gotten worse and worse. So I don't, I've never quite understood how supposedly we're not getting more people, but we are getting more people. And that, that, that explains the housing crisis. Like we haven't built more, but there's a lot more people here. So this will mean more congestion. And I think, I think when these projects get proposed, the people in whose neighborhoods they're going to be in will bring up these two issues strongly and loudly. No one's gonna say we don't need more housing. I mean, it's obvious we do, um, but it, I think the planning department and government as a whole is gonna be said, how can we do this? Where will the water come from and what will it do to my trying to ever drive to South County. And I think we need to start developing those answers as part of this whole process. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be very well received or even well implemented. You know, this all has to be coordinated. Now it's very fine for me to say, I don't envy people trying to do it, but I, I think these questions need to be asked from the start. And I think we need to keep asking them and not just do this in a disjointed area, unless this is a political strategy on our part. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't address traffic uh, very, very much. Um, 
CEQA requires that we now look at vehicle miles traveled. Um, and this is a measurement of how much people are driving. And I think when you talk about the increased congestion on the road, in part, that's because of some of the things that we've been talking about, which are the uh, disconnect between our land uses and our transportation facilities. Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about transportation at the next meeting. Um, okay. There's a whole list of projects that are proposed um, and uh, over time, and we'll talk about um, some of the uh, regional projects that are proposed that are also addressed in the EIR, but aren't particularly the county's projects. Um, and that is all those projects and, and the work that um, a lot of work has been done with the Public Works Department to um, or old public works department site of the of this new community development and infrastructure department to really nail down what those projects are so that they can start appearing on the capital improvement program. So we will we'll talk a, a lot more about that. I I like to say that um, it's this isn't disjointed at all. We you know we've taken a, a tremendous amount of time years uh, looking at how we marry these two. Uh, land use and transportation things together. We just are not talking a lot about transportation today. My okay. last point is that every single development will have to address um, in, in an upcoming um, document and traffic study what their particular impacts are in the neighborhood. It's, it's required by our existing codes. Uh, they need to look at delay at stoplights and make sure that they're not adding um, uh, to um, the issues on the roadways. And if they are, they need to mitigate for those impacts. So um, I won't pretend that we've, uh, you know, that we've been able to look at the, you know, what this individual site does to, to traffic in its immediate neighborhood because it's such a big program. It's a 20 year growth plan. It's, it's at a much higher level than the individual. But the individual, impacts will be looked at when new development is proposed. And there is no new development proposed as a part of this project, just to kind of throw that in there too. Can I, can I jump yes. in on this? Um, sorry, I wasn't planning to say anything, but I had a number of comments based on the conversation. Um, one, the first is that, you know, we can't really look at the county as a separate entity. The county hasn't really grown much in the last 30 years, but Santa Cruz and Watsonville have grown quite a bit. So that explains um, a lot of some of the impacts of, on growth. The university has grown enormously, and we should also be sure to take into consideration that the university is planning to grow another 10,000 students. Um, in the next 10 years, and that is does not include the faculty and other support staff that will be coming um, to town to support that growth in students. So, um, so I think that we have to be able to look at that in order to understand we're not, you know, we're separate as far as governing goes, but we're not separate as far as how we use the county and where we live and all that. Um, so Stephanie, you said something um, about the RENA numbers, or, and I wasn't quite sure, you said that the state is asking the county to build, to zone for 33,000 units, is that right? Is that Not, for the whole region or just for the county? That's for the region. Okay, that's thanks for that, the three county region. That's a super region. important distinction because, you know, that's, yeah, and the region encompasses Santa Cruz County, the four cities, Monterey County, and San Benito, just to make that clear. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Okay, yep. um, Okay. that's it. I'll save the rest for later. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Lazenby, did you have any questions or comments at this time? I just have one, and this has to do again with the infill and the state requirements that we concentrate on infill. In some of these identified parcels, how do we, um, well, if the, if the main objective is to have consolidated living, housing, and then um, 
with ha having services around it within 15 minutes, some of these parcels would not qualify for those. Is that correct? Um, I, I think the parcels that are, and we'll talk more about the zoning map changes and the uh, residential flex um, parcels in a latter part of this discussion. Um, but there, there are um, uh, services on those uh, main uh, corridors that be, begin, you know, it's a 20 year plan and these are policies, right? It's not the 15 minute neighborhood is a, is a vision and a goal. Um, it's not a, necessarily a regulation where we don't allow the development if, unless you have a grocery store within walking distance. Um, this is the development framework over time. Um, and so I think that's an important distinction of the policies, which are implementing a vision versus how we regulate an individual development on, on a site. Um, so if that if that's helpful at all. Yeah, just just if I can add to that, I think um, you know, supporting like ResFlex, new ResFlex sites in areas near transit and services is one objective, but I would say sort of overall goal and strategy is to support a variety of housing choices. So I think um, you know, it's, it's kind of a broader sort of vision. Well, I think I think my Biggest concern would be getting employment to these sites within, so that you don't create even a worse traffic situation. If these people, let's say they're already employed somewhere, maybe even South County, then these um, the residential flex buildings in the infill would would very likely just be moving people from one location to that location, and then they would have to go back to their employment. And that would be possibly by car. Um, or possibly by transit over time, right? So that's the purpose of having um, more intense development, both residential and commercial, by the way, we haven't talked about commercial development yet, right. um, over um, in, in assimilated in kind of areas so we can begin to reduce some of that travel because we, we agree that's definitely, it's definitely an issue. The amount that people are driving and the fact that they're in their cars alone, um, driving from home to work is part of what we're trying to address here. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Um, I had one specific question that I, you know, I have a lot to, to ask, but I'll save most of them also. Um, but one thing in particular that stood out to me from this part of the presentation that I really want to understand, and it goes on page 10, I believe, of the report, where it says something along the lines of, only affordable housing developers will get densities over 45 units an acre. And, and I just need, I just want to understand that a little bit better because to me, densities, you know, if, if, well, let me start by just asking you to clarify that. And then I want to uh, maybe talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to clarify. Yeah. The, um, the staff report was more trying to sort of explain like based on recent projects that we've received generally like most market rate projects are done at like 26 or units less per acre so so the it was more explaining that we don't expect to see you know higher densities of market rate projects but certainly anybody who uh, any developer or property owner who wants to provide additional affordable units on their property can certainly, um, you know, do so according to our density bonus standards. And, um, you know, if they provide the number of um, additional units, they can qualify for that density bonus and request, uh, you know, concessions to our development standards as well. 
So you're you're saying thank you for that. I just want to sum it up in my own words, make sure I really get it. That affordable housing developers will use the density bonus where other developers wouldn't. Is that really what it kind of boils down to? Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Go ahead, Annie. You, you go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, I any any developer. I, I think we do have some market rate projects where people do, um, you know, a, not a nonprofit developer, but an average developer may say, "I want to, you know, I want a couple additional units," and I may, you know, I may instead of qualifying, you know, in our current, instead of qualifying for 17.4, maybe they'll qualify for 22 units, you know, provide 22 units per acre and then, you know, request waivers. So, so certainly they can apply and we do see those just in terms of the, you know, getting up more than 26 units per acre at that level, what, based on what we've seen in the past, those are generally done by nonprofit developers. I don't know if that helps clarify. Yes, understood. I would, I have a couple of opinions on that just because it's kind of my line of work also, right? From the client's side or the other side of the table, so. Yeah. No, just Good. to clarify here, yeah. make sure we're really clear. There's no restriction, right? You don't have to be an affordable housing developer. What, sure. we're, what we're trying to portray here is that we'll probably see things in the big range. And typically, you know, we'll folks who are interested, in market rate units will come in probably at a lower density, but still have options, right? So it's right. a wide wide range of, of um, possibility. Okay. I guess where my, my um, it's coming down to is like the idea of 60 units an acre was there, but then it was reduced because it didn't feel like people would use it. And that to me has a big red flag on it because it sounds more like that we are creating a, a policy that doesn't actually financially work for non-affordable housing developers. That's how I read that because we're saying we could do more, but we're not going to because we, you know, we don't think people would use it. Only affordable housing developers that use state density bonus and get funding from the state will want to build at these densities. And I would say that it's kind of the office that at least. That's what, oh, what I'm trying to understand is how if you didn't, if you made it denser, don't you think more people would develop at those densities? Or why did we really decide to go from that 60 to that 45? Um, I could it have something to do with the height restriction? Because then you'd have to make the units so small that, that people in the market rate category wouldn't want to buy that. I mean, it's all comes down to economics and supply and demand. I mean, I had the same question, Tim, when I read that, I had to read it a few times to understand what staff was saying. But, and then it made me think of that project on Rodriguez that um, was a lower density than they could have built. But in my view, that was because the developer wanted to sell at a certain price point. Um, and that's why the density was lower. So I think that what I understood staff to be saying was, this has just been the pattern, but it doesn't necessarily um, have to be the reality going forward. I think you're just trying to soften the the, the density below, I guess, for the, yeah, the The intention wasn't, you know, that only nonprofit developers could apply for that higher density at all. The, the idea was more that if people want to construct like more than 44 units per acre at that point, we would like to see more affordable units in that project. So if you want to go above that, then you know you're you are going to need to provide that some of those units are affordable beyond what's normally required. So it was more a sort of way to um, really try and encourage more affordable units in these higher density projects, basically. Yeah, just to clarify a little on that, we um, we did we did lower the density in the RF, and that was because we wanted to continue to encourage developers to use the density bonus and provide more affordable units in these developments. We didn't want to kind of cut the, cut that program off by letting them just do it. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. And I, um, I would also say the other balancing act is, you know, um, I think affordable housing developers would, would really encourage us to go higher 
um, but we're also trying to um, promote an approach that integrates well into the community. So it's a little bit, we think, we're hoping we've kind of struck the right balance here, you know, because we have people on both sides saying, you can't build 45 units per acre here. And we also have um, affordable housing advocates saying you really need to go higher. So yeah. it's definitely a balancing act for this community. Understood. Okay, that's all great feedback. Thank you all, I appreciate that. Um, one just follow up question on that. I'm sure I'll have more discussion on this, but is it is there any adjustment to what a required affordable housing component is for non state density bonus projects? Like I believe right now that there's not an affordability component to rental projects. Is that the case? No required affordability component. And if we need to look into it, that's fine too. Just you know, sometimes those two things are married. So you get more people to use the density bonus if you already require some form of affordable housing as a baseline, right? So then people know they already have to do the affordable housing. So then they'll use the state density bonus and you'll get more units out of it. But if we don't have any kind of required affordable housing component, we're not gonna get that affordable housing unless people use the state density bonus because why do they need to? We have affordable housing requirements as well. It's just that if you're a lower uh, intense, development you can do a fee in lieu of so you can right. I think it's seven units you could pay a fee and above that you have to start incorporating of affordable units that, and that's true on for sale and for rent projects yeah Lizanne might know might have something to add here but um uh there are requirements for for both that are county requirements great Looks like yeah, I, if I was going to add anything, I would probably defer to Suzanne in our housing section, who's really the expert on uh, all of the issues on affordability. Okay. I tend to look at it on a more um, project by project basis, okay. so it's hard to make generalized statements. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to preface that a lot of the questions that I have in particular are probably fairly technical for a conversation like this. And so I might, you know, add follow up with the with a write-up that has, you know, a little bit more specific detail so that you don't have to put on the spot and don't dig through the code right now and all that kind of stuff. We can just kind of talk about it generally and then I'll, I can follow up. So yeah. I appreciate that. And staff is happy to answer any questions um, and provide more information at a later meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I will say that uh, our affordable housing requirements are in place um, and we are, we are not um, proposing changes to those or density bonus um, because they're already in place. So um, we can provide more information on what those are exactly, if that'd be helpful. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, that's the only topic I had. So if anyone else has anything, go ahead. Otherwise, we can move on. Okay. Keep going. Uh, Are we moving on with the presentation? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Let's please uh, move on to the next uh, part of the presentation. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, commissioners. Then we will move on to uh, commercial and mixed use development. Um, for <clears throat> commercial and industrial development, the policies and regulations in the sustainability update encourage uh, vibrant activity centers within focused growth areas. Um, Stephanie, are you sharing your screen or? Uh, thought I was sharing. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's <laughs> Let okay. me do that again. <laughs> Wait a moment for the slide to pop up. Uh, that one. Apologize. Okay. Can we, we see it now? Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so some activity centers may be focused on employment or school, such as Cabrillo College or the Sukhel Drive Medical Center area. Other activity centers may be focused on community gathering or shopping and entertainment, such as Lower 41st Avenue and Portola Drive and Pleasure Point. Policies for activity centers prioritize ground floor, 
commercial focused businesses such as restaurants and retail paired with office and residential land uses so that workers and residents can walk to local businesses. The sustainability update also seeks to address the jobs, housing, and balance, whereby many people who can afford to live in the county continue to commute over the hill. Policies allowing for more modern, flexible office development can enable the construction of buildings for high paying job growth sectors such as healthcare and innovation and tech. The policy, the project also recognizes that there is less demand for brick and mortar retail given the increase in e-commerce over the past decades. Standalone retail development and even many mixed use developments under current standards are not generally financially feasible in today's market. Given this reality, policies in the sustainability update allow for more flexibility in mixed use development. Policies also encourage visitor accommodations such as hotels and motels within activity centers with varied price points. Overall, the non-residential policies in the general plan aim to increase economic vitality for Santa Cruz County, and these policies align with the county's economic vitality study, which was adopted in 2014. Now let's take a closer look at the new Workplace Flex Zone District. Proposed standards for this district are similar to other commercial districts, except that the overall building height may be 50 feet rather than 40 feet, and a first story floor to ceiling height of at least 15 feet is required. The purpose of these regulations is to allow for maximum commercial flexibility um, and various uses inside the building. A conceptual site plan for workplace flex development is shown on the slide, along with images of what interior spaces and streetscape design might look like. Flexible workplaces can accommodate a mix of office, light industrial, and retail uses for large businesses, such as a tech company that includes both office and research and development, or these buildings could house groups of small businesses, such as the repurposed sash mill in the city of Santa Cruz. Chapter six of the new county design guidelines is focused on workplace flex and provides best practices for building, siting, design, and massing. Another key change to commercial regulations in the county code is the introduction of special standards and guidelines for mixed use residential and commercial development which include both vertical mixed use, where residential units are incorporated into the same building with commercial development, usually with ground floor commercial, and horizontal mixed use, where residential units are located in a separate building. On this slide, example projects are shown from the design guidelines for both vertical and horizontal mixed use. As you can see, mixed use projects come in all shapes and sizes. The existing county code does not provide special standards for mixed use developments currently. And as a result, commercial standards are applied, which are not always appropriate for residential units. New standards have been added for density, open space, and setbacks for mixed use that are appropriate for this context. This includes increasing allowed maximum density from 17.4 to 45 dwelling units per acre as provided for the ResFlex district. This residential allowance would also increase from 50 to 75% of the building square footage to reflect the increased demand for commercial development and, and increased need for housing, excuse me, to reflect the decreased demand for commercial development and the increased need for housing while continuing to ensure land is available for commercial use. Using a percentage approach is also appropriate where commercial and residential uses are provided in separate buildings. The code also clarifies that density bonus provisions apply on mixed use sites in accordance with state law. These standards work together with chapter five of the design guidelines, which focus on mixed use development with considerations for site and building design and appropriate transition to residential neighborhoods. The sustainability update also includes new regulations for hospitals and medical mixed use developments reflecting the unique needs of these development types and the county's goal of maintaining and further developing a healthcare employment center along the Soquel Drive corridor in Live Oak. These projects should be located on large sites 
in areas where a concentration of medical services and commercial activity is planned. It should also combine the development of hospitals, medical offices, and clinics, along with complementary land uses such as retail, restaurants, and commercial services, as well as various types of high density housing. Medical mixed use standards include a maximum height of 60 feet and four stories rather than the usual three stories for other non-residential uses in order to accommodate hospital programming, elevators, and mechanical equipment. Large lot coverage is higher than what is usually allowed in the public facilities district to accommodate buildings and parking garages. These sites would also be eligible for a density bonus with the provision of additional affordable units beyond what is already required. Additional updates to allow land uses, development standards and guidelines in commercial and industrial zone districts align with modern practice and state laws and further implement the policy goals in the general plan. In order to facilitate appropriate neighborhood commercial development, smaller commercial, commercial parcels are allowed to provide greater flexibility for neighborhood and community commercial sites. Setbacks for commercial buildings adjacent to residential and non-commercial agricultural properties are slightly reduced. However, a new setback applies to any third story, requiring that a minimum of 50% of the third floor exterior walls be set back an additional 10 feet from property setback lines. This additional setback ensures that buildings maintain a human scale, reduces bulk and mass, and alleviates potential privacy and shadow impacts to neighbors. In order to facilitate vibrant activity centers and commercial corridors, the code amendments include reductions in use permit requirements for small businesses, as well as requiring active commercial uses such as retail and restaurants and ground floors along multimodal corridors and main streets. Also, the overall building height in commercial zone districts other than workplace flex has been increased from 35 to 40 feet to accommodate more spacious ground floors. Uh, also, streetscape standards and guidelines have been added to encourage the creation and maintenance of streetscape amenities. Appendix A of the County Design Guidelines provides streetscape guidelines for each major corridor type. Um, a main street illustration from that appendix is provided on this slide. And more details regarding um, these guidelines will be provided at the um, later study session in June. The sustainability update also establishes a new FAR of 1.0 for commercial visitor office and industrial land use designations as a measure of building intensity. The new FAR standard responds to state law, which requires local governments to establish standards of population density and building intensity for each land use designation. The floor area ratio of one is sufficient to accommodate allowed commercial uses while providing sufficient area for parking in accordance with the reduced parking ratios provided in the sustainability update. And we'll be reviewing parking standards at the June 20 uh, study session. For industrial zone districts, industrial zone districts, new uses have been added, including wet labs and dry labs and cooperative maker spaces. Building heights have been increased to 40 feet to match commercial standards. And finally, commercial and land use uses and definitions have been updated and modernized. Um, for reference, this table summarizes the key changes to commercial development standards. Um, this is just provided for reference. These changes have been reviewed on the previous slide. Um, so now before we're moving on to map amendments, um, if your commission likes, we can uh, take a pause here to discuss any questions and comments regarding um, commercial, mixed use, and industrial development. Thank you so much. Um, I know I had one specific question regarding this section. Uh, other commissioners? Um, I don't. I'd prefer to just keep going through. Okay. In this case, I agree. Okay. I I will wait until after the uh, the public has made their input. Great, thank you so much. Um, I can save my question also, though it's 
kind of specific and might get us into some conversation. So I'll push off till later. Uh, so please continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Then I will turn the presentation back over to Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now we wanted to take a little time to um, review the MAP amendments that are included in the project. Um, the sustainability update includes some general plan um, land use map and zoning map amendments to 23 selected parcels throughout the county. There are two types of land use changes. Uh, the first type of amendments are to eliminate inconsistencies between general plan maps and the zoning maps or establish land use uh, uses on 13 parcels throughout the county. Um, the county is required by state law to ensure consistency between the general plan land use designations and the zoning map. Um, no intensification of land uses is proposed as a result of these corrections. The uh, second type of, land, of uh, uh, map changes include the targeted rezonings along transportation corridors to implement the sustainable framework and introduce the new um, uh, urban high flex and residential flex land use designation um, into the community. Uh, the first of the map amendments can be found on what's included. Um, and uh, they're also attached to the staff report. Um, uh, so first we're gonna review the uh, map consistency changes. The aerials on this slide show eight parcels in the mid-county area that are proposed for correction. There are two parcels on uh, Bromer that have uh, residential care and they'll change to multifamily zoning consistent with their land use. It's two parcels on SoCal San Jose Road that'll change to public facilities. Um, that's the cemetery uh, up there. Two parcels on uh, Laurel Glen Road that are partially zoned commercial will have their general plan designations and zoning cleaned up to recognize their rural agricultural uh, and residential land uses. And two parcels on Glen Haven Road will also have their general plan designations amended to match their zoning and their uh, designated agricultural soils. These maps show changes in North County. There's one in Davenport and then four in South County. The parcel in Davenport shown on the left will change from residential zoning to match its existing commercial uh, land use. So it'll change to commercial zoning. In South County, one parcel in the Selva Beach uh, area, La Selva Beach area will change from public facilities to residential to match its existing land use. Two, oh, sorry, something happened to my slides. Okay. Um, two parcels along Freedom Boulevard will, um, with existing electrical and social club facilities will change from agricultural to public facilities to match those existing land uses and a portion of one parcel up on Hames Road where there's an active winery will change from commercial ag to just commercial zoning to match its general plan designation. There's no agricultural soils on that part of the uh, parcel that one's shown in yellow at the top of the slide. Uh, and no, I should say, no intensification of land use is expected on those map um, changes that I reviewed. Um, 10 parcels have been identified for rezoning to the new residential flex zone district along major transportation routes, namely Soquel um, Drive and Portola Drive. Rezoning these properties begins to implement the new RF district. Uh, to support development of new housing options and to encourage sustainable development pattern. No development itself is proposed as part of the sustainability update project. The map on the left shows the uh, property at Thurber Lane and Soquel Drive. Um, this, this property is currently zoned for neighborhood commercial and professional administrative offices. 
the amendments proposed would be a mix of residential and commercial uses to support the medical uses within the Soquel Drive corridor. Uh, the northern portion of the site would be uh, for residential flex uh, to accommodate workforce housing, while the southern portion would be rezoned to community commercial, which can accommodate neighborhoods serving uses such as offices, restaurants, and visitor accommodations such as hotels. The map on the right shows nine parcels located along Portola Drive that are now primarily zoned for a variety of commercial uses. These sites would be rezoned to residential flex to facilitate a transition to a mix of multifamily and residential units interspersed with neighborhood commercial, consistent with the vision for the western portion of the corridor in the Pleasure Point vision and um, design principles. Um, next year, as we work to try to meet our RENA and update our housing element, we'll be using the residential flex tool um, and zoning district in more areas to help accommodate our housing needs. In addition to the residential flex development standards that we already reviewed, special design principles apply to the development on sites within the Pleasure Point corridor in place of the regular multifamily design guidelines that are also in the um, document. These design principles are taken from the Pleasure Point Corridor Study and they're provided as Appendix B of the design guidelines. They'll ensure that development fits within the community vision for the corridor, which was described in part as a place characterized by buildings with the varied architectural styles and sizes, compatible with local character, interesting open spaces, and with attainable workforce housing. Recognizing the eclectic architectural character and beach aesthetic, the, these design principles require the incorporation of natural materials. On the north side of Portola Drive, new development would continue to provide views of the mountains to the north. To minimize the appearance of building mass and maintain a human scale, building frontages must be articulated and three, third stories um, along Portola must be stepped back from the lower floors. Parking would be required to be located to the rear of the site when feasible, so it's not fronting on Portola Drive. To minimize the appearance of building height, taller massing would be located uh, in the center of a parcel. New development adjacent to residential properties must provide appropriate transitions and privacy and maintain the village feel of Pleasure Point. New development would be required to provide a 20 foot rear setback to residential parcels rather than the 15 foot setback that's in the residential flex uh, standards. An additional five foot setback is required for any third floor adjacent to a residential site. This translates to a 10 foot side setback from any third story abutting a residential property and a 25 foot rear setback for a third story abutting a residential property. The design guidelines works with um, chapter 1311 in the Santa Cruz County Code to require landscaping to create a shaded and inviting pedestrian experience, including a minimum of one tree for every 50 feet of linear footage in the residential projects and incorporates sustainable developable, uh, development features in building and site design, such as solar energy and rainwater cisterns. Um, we wanted to just take a moment to review uh, public outreach again that's done for this project. Um, public outreach has been done extensively across a variety of planning efforts that have led up to, to the sustainability update. Um, in particular, the um, visioning uh, meetings done for the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan, which was accepted by the board back in 2014. The Pleasure Point guideline principles were also developed with input from local residents at community workshops and ultimately incorporated into the, that vision and designing guiding principles uh, in 2018. Public outreach efforts for the current uh, sustainable update uh, documents has also been extensive, especially since the draft documents were released in February. Newspaper ads and social media campaign as well as email blasts continue to inform the public about the project. 
the county launched, launched the website in 2020, which now includes all the draft documents. Documents are linked in your staff report as exhibit A. Project website also provides summaries and fact sheets available in English and Spanish, a detailed summary of relevant topics in today's presentation. Um, the public has a variety of ways that they can provide comments on the documents. Uh, several comments have been submitted via the public comment portal available on the website as well as by email. And a survey uh, also provides additional opportunities for input. Earlier this spring, uh, staff held a series of six community meetings organized by topic. Recordings of these meetings are available um, on the project website. Staff has presented study sessions um, with the Agricultural Policy Advisory Committee, Housing Advisory Commission, and the Latino Affairs Commission. Comments and feedback from these meetings are included in your packet as exhibits D, E, F, and G. Um, today's staff report also provides a summary of the uh, feedback, and we'll say a lot of the comments are about residential um, flex. And the reason why we want to review this is because um, there's a lot of comments in the packet. And uh, even though we were concerned or the commission was concerned that there um, was not a lot of public who showed up at your last meeting, we just wanted to review that the invitation and the tools for commenting on the project um, have been available. And um, we've made many efforts to do outreach and there's a lot of comments that are provided in the in the packets. Um, on that note, I just want to let you know that um, my boss sent out a newsletter um, highlighting the sustainability plan, and you know he can monitor how many clicks it got, and there were over 40 clicks. So it looks like people are reading, well, at least taking a look at the plan, um, maybe not commenting but that doesn't mean folks aren't um, engaging in some form. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. Thank you for that. Um, looking ahead, we'll have two more study sessions with the commission. Um, the next one is on June 22nd, and it'll focus on transportation, parks, and public facilities. And the final study session will be on July 13th to review updates related to the code modernization project, agriculture, and natural resources. We'll also review the draft EIR at that meeting. Following the two study sessions, staff will return to the Planning Commission in August for public hearings and a recommendation. So with that, we'll end our uh, presentation today with the recommended action, which is to conduct a study session on the sustainability update uh, focused on the built environment, including amendments to the general plan, county code, uh, design uh, principles and guidelines and amendments to the land use and zoning maps. And that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you very much. And we're available for any questions. Hey, Sarah, you. I have a yeah, quick question please. just on meeting schedule and process. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand we have, um, it looks like at least on the calendar, we have um, another meeting in August, August 10th. And I wonder, um, if that could be a placeholder for, I don't know, any other lingering um, issues that the commission might have. If that, I just wanted to plant that seed and no decisions need to be made now, but maybe commissioners can think about that. Um, and that can be something that we can talk about at our next meeting. Yes, I was going to suggest something very similar. There's so much information to get through here, and there's going to be follow up, and it'd be really nice to have another opportunity, especially on this topic. That's like kind of a big bulk of what this is to be able to follow up. So um, I appreciate that. Um, so we can take a minute and ask any follow up questions really quickly here, or can we can. Uh, move on to public comment and and hope to get that done here before our 1130 lunch break. Um, that would be my preference, but I'd love to hear the other commissioners if that's acceptable. Yes, great. Okay, why don't we do that? Let's move to open the public comment at this time. And members of the public will have three minutes to speak on this topic. Um, 
Ms. Jess, do we have any members of the public that would like to, to uh, speak at this time? Yes, we do. Um, I'm seeing two hands raised at the moment, and I just want to remind everybody before we start that if you wish to speak on this item or have any questions, you can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if you're calling in by telephone, you raise your hand by pressing star nine on the phone dial pad. Um, so with that said, uh, the first person um, is Patricia Brady. And uh, I have you. Good morning. Good morning, Patty. Um, I'd like to ask a couple specific questions and then make a brief comment. Um, we keep hearing the word 33,000 homes needed and today it was clarified that it was for Monterey County, San Benito County, Santa Cruz County. I'd really appreciate the number that's truly needed for Santa Cruz. What is that mandate? Also, um, the infrastructure needs that are discussed, water services, transportation, are issues that are relevant right now. Pleasure Point has sent an opinion paper to many county leadership, most of you that are on this um, webinar today regarding the fact that we do not support um, urban residential flex high density for Portola Drive. We do support urban residential. It is a difference of approximately 100 um, housing units, but we feel that Pleasure Point's infrastructure is already tired and this will overtax it. We also sent you, in addition to our opinion paper, um, an eight question survey results that 98 members in four days answer the questions. So you see not only the responses to our questions, but also their individual comments. Um, water services are really critical. Transportation really doesn't happen in this county at this point. The, la the last bus is 6.30, maybe another one at 9.30. There's no end to end in this community. And we, when we keep talking about over time, a 20 year period means that these issues will just become more drastic. So I really think that in some ways, the priorities need to flop that we resolve some of these infrastructure issues before we move ahead with such as high, super high density, which again, we do not oppose growth. We do not oppose development but we do oppose 45 units per acre in addition to density bonuses, which are really minimized in these discussions. Also, I'd like to point out that in lieu fees were paid by most developers versus um, in, incorporating low income or modified in, income into their housing projects. If we're gonna have density bonuses, it should be mandatory that they do this. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your time um, to our community. Thank you, Patty. All right, so um, the next person we have is um, Alex Vartan. Alex, you can now speak. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi, I just want to, again, um, thank you for um, the time uh, to comment publicly. Um, I've taken a pretty close look of uh, all the documents. Um, I'll start by saying I'm both a resident um, and also a commercial property owner and small time developer in the Pleasure Point Live Oak area. I own two properties on Portola Drive, one of which I live on, so I'm um, <laughs> very sensitive to a lot of the uh, infrastructure and um, uh, especially traffic and uh, uh, um, um, livability issues. Um, but as also uh, a millennial and first time homeowner, um, you know, I do have some comments on the residential and commercial, um, some of the standards. I will try and give just a high level and leave the rest for some extensive written comments that I'm preparing. But I think would like to uh, start with, I think um, some of the uh, height and the, and the um, floor area ratio uh, constraints and standards are too low on some of the uh, proposed residential multifamily. 
Um, I do think that the uh, the, the RF density is is plenty, especially considering um, the uh, the prospects for um, density bonus. I think um, I'm looking at the different jurisdictions: um, San Luis Obispo, um, floor area ratio of 2.0. I'm in Fresno visiting my family in the residential multifamily, it's 1.5, 2.0 for higher density. Um, I think the increases are just sort of dramatically uh, low and surprising. Um, and I do think at this point, um, there does need to be some sense and recognition to really to not surprise the public that um, the state density bonus law is really extremely powerful. and. Some of these uh, limitations, including on height and, and even floor area ratio um, with um, some of these new state laws are very easily, um, I guess, uh, and uh, with strong legal protections, um, developers and planning uh, departments are allowed to um, uh, um, set those limits aside. In addition, um, the commercial development, I'm actually a little more concerned about commercial standards, um, given the um, very uh, a small amount of land and importance to economic development about some of the height and floor area ratios. I also think they're too low and commercial, if you're doing 100% commercial, you do lack um, the prospect of the density bonus. So floor area ratio of 1.0 is just really, really dramatically low and should be um, significantly higher. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next up, we have uh, Betsy Anderson. Uh, at Betsy, you're able to talk. Please unmute yourself. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, the images shared. While I know that this is a long-term plan, um, what I noticed was a significant lack of images that show really um, what it will look like with parking and with people's cars. Most of the photos and images have a charming feel, and I think that's probably what develop, what we're looking for in this um, change of character to the neighborhood for this necessary development. But um, I think it would be really important for all of us to be able to see what it really looks like when we have um, potentially up to 40, let's say 30 units that all have cars that need a place to park and sometimes multiple um, cars as well. So that's my comment for now. And thank you so much for hosting these informative meetings. Much appreciated. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. So if you do wish to speak, um, please raise your hand by hitting. Uh, hitting the star, the icon on your the hand icon or star nine on your phone. Uh, I have Janine. Janine, hello, good morning. Hello there, uh, my name is Janine, and I want to thank you first of all for the presentation and the review of what is a lot, a lot of material. So thank you for, um, for this presentation. I do like the general direction of the uh, urban residential flex designation and that you're recognizing the need for all sorts of uh, missing middle infill um, housing. 
Um, I'm going to keep my comments general at this time, um, leave more specifics for written comment. But generally, I wanted to say that I recently heard uh, the county's chief administrative officer describe the unincorporated county as the equivalent of a city, given that there's a population of 140,000 people. Um, and in listening to the presentation and reading the materials, I'm wondering if you're considering the significance of this number and being ambitious enough, um, especially when it comes to some of the things that have come up multiple times, like density and height, especially along the significant corridors. I'll, notice, I'll note that the height increases by a mere five feet um, along the corridors. Um, I also just want to say that Stephanie's explanation about the limited population growth of the county was really confusing. Um, when I look at your progress in the fifth cycle of RENA, the county is woefully behind in developing housing, and I know that the population growth is limited, um, limits some of the permit allocations as well. So the county has some catching up to do when it comes to having sufficient housing already, um, and especially, as has been discussed, affordable housing and attainable housing. Um, and then a minor point, AMBAG is really only Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. It doesn't include San Benito. Um, but thanks again for what is a really comprehensive um, set of materials. And I'll leave, as I say, my comments at this high level. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Janine. Do we have anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Um, hit the hit the hand icon at the bottom of your screen or uh, star nine on your telephone if you'd like to speak. All right, we have Henry Hooker. Hi, good morning, Henry. Good morning, can you hear me? We can hear you. Good, uh, I just have a few comments. There seems to be an underlying assumption that market rate housing is luxury housing and that's bad housing because what we need is affordable housing. The problem here is that we need all of the above. And to the extent that we limit market rate housing, we encourage those seeking market rate housing to purchase or rent the existing housing stock, which is exactly what's happening throughout the county at this moment because we're not focusing on building housing. Everybody says, well, we want to have affordable housing, but not market rate housing. Um, second, I would simply echo what others have said, which is that the increased densities that are proposed are really insufficient to the needs of what we have and it was effectively the uh, available land. And it really <laughs> makes less possible the notion of the walkable neighborhood. Um, you, density is a good thing in that sense. Um, and I think that you all know that, but you're just reaching for too little. Um, and it's curious that one of your slides shows the uh, a senior apartment center in Santa Clara, which it says is 58 units per acre. Um, and it looks great. And it, I think that, you know, a lot of this just has to do with perception and the notion that uh, 60 units per acre is much worse than 45 units per acre. It's not necessarily true. And as planners, I think you know that FAR and units per acre and, and those measures are kind of rough tools and that there are actually better tools that are becoming in vogue, form-based uh, zoning requirements that really allow you to target what you want the neighborhood to look like rather than uh, these other things that really don't work so well. And it's surprising to me that in this most recent uh, take on the sustainability thing that you haven't incorporated any of those measures. Anyway, it's a great effort, and I realize that you're definitely going in the right direction, and I'm very supportive of it, and I just wish that you would do more. Thanks very much. Ms. Jess, you're, you are muted.
Sorry about that. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else at this time who wishes to speak. Um, if anyone would like to speak, just uh, raise your hand, uh, hit the hand icon or star nine on your phone. It looks as if everybody who had a question or who wanted to speak on this item has already spoken. So I'll turn that back to you, Chair Gordon. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jess. Thank you to the Oops. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the public for those comments. We really appreciate them. I appreciate um, everyone's feedback and, and you know, this is an opportunity to provide that. And so uh, thank you for showing up and, and, and saying what you said. Um, we can close the public comment at this time. And it's normally when we bring it back for discussion, I know we're all ready to go. We do have a required lunch break around 1130, which we could take now and then jump into discussion after. Um, if that's all right with the commission, I would suggest that and just want to get everyone's take on if that uh, would work. I'm open to what others want to do. I'd actually prefer to just keep going if that's okay with everybody else, but, uh, but happy to take a break too. Uh, I have to leave at noon today, so I would obviously prefer to keep going. We've got 45 minutes. Hopefully we can get all our comments done by then. I know certainly I can. Um, I know, Tim, you have a lot to say, um, yeah. but 45 minutes is a long time. We could work till then. I believe that's a CTV requirement for a lunch break. And so, um, which I was requested to make sure we provide it on the longer hearings. And so I think we need to make that happen. However, um, the timing of it, it could be pushed a little bit. I think we've traditionally taken a lunch break for the planning commission at 12 anyway, so. At noon? Mm-hmm. And, okay. and we usually have taken an hour or a half an hour if we have a big agenda. So I think if we keep going to noon, that would be the expectation that I think most people probably have anyway. Okay. I think that that works. And CTV or Ms. Jess could correct me if I'm wrong there um, as to how long we can go before we need a lunch break. For it. Yeah, I'm just checking with CTV that they're okay with um holding off until noon to take a break. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I hear back. Great. Why don't we just get started and then uh, just feel free to interrupt interrupt us, Ms. Jess, when we have that information and we can go from there. And if they're able to work through, if that's a possibility, I think we'd all be open to that. Um, I'm not sure the regulations there, so I appreciate you digging into that. Um, okay, great. Well, then let's get started on some discussion and further questions. Which commissioner would like to get started? Well, if you don't mind, since I'm going to have to leave at noon, um, sure. I don't have a lot yeah. to say. I want to say, the main thing I want to say is to thank staff for this incredible document and the huge amount of work and careful thought that goes going into it. I'm really impressed, period. I don't want to, I have no other adjectives to say except that it's really a very good work. And I understand the necessity for, um, all of it, and I think the changes suggested in this particular area make sense to me, and I support them, long and short of it. Good, that was short and sweet. Wonderful, thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Um, I, I can go next, if that's okay. Yes, I'll please, try to keep, keep them brief. Um, so I agree with everything <laughs> Commissioner Shepard said. Um, what I said last time, it's um, an incredible amount of work gone into this. So I wanted to start with some um, questions about FAR and um, open space. And I know I touched on this last time too. Um, so on the photos, I, I do find the photos in the presentation really helpful and we don't have those in the staff report. So when I'm reading about, you know, the changes to the open space requirements, I'm trying to visualize, well, what does that look like in terms of a project? It's really helpful to have those. Um, photos in the PowerPoint. Um, one of the things that, um, that I'm trying to wrap my head around is, um, is I understand we're requiring, um, we have an open space requirement for the new RF zone, zone district. Um, so, but what I'm, what I guess I would like more examples of in the future are, is to show, to show me how that could work built out and what 
kind of open space that would look like, if that makes sense. And I understand that it can be flexible, like personal open space versus communal open space. But it would be really helpful for me, like I can visualize, okay, an acre is, you know, this much square feet. And so that would be this much square footage of open space. Um, but if there's some examples out there visually or, or in our county that we have, um, that would be helpful. Um, and so I'll probably keep touching on that every single time. Um, and then I had a couple questions specifically from the staff report. Um, oh, okay, right. So on page nine, um, talking about net developable area, we are changing, this is a, something that is um, a relatively significant change in what we're, what we're doing. Um, can you just talk me through what was, you know, the uh, intent of excluding um, certain undevelopable areas for to get the, the net developable area um, for a parcel and then walk me through why we're making that change now. So like what was the original ten, intent and then what's the basis for the change? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I I think Annie's probably better situated to address the original intent. I, I would say big picture, we're, we're in a big shift here, right? From kind of limiting or controlling development to recognizing that we, we need to change to accommodate people in our community and all the things that we've been talking about. So big, big picture that way. And then I'll bet Annie can help us with some more detail. Um, yes, you know, I don't know the actual intent, although I, um, you know, I do think in the past in general, a lot of our code is focused on like, you know, slowing down growth and, you know, making it a little challenging to develop. So I think some of that, you know, like, the approach of excluding certain developable areas and then applying density credit for some was sort of, um, you know, a way to kind of constrain development. Um, and in terms of the reason for doing it, um, it it basically like we're not proposing to change, you know, the the densities in general of like RM zone districts because it is defined by the zone district which establishes the the minimum site area per dwelling, but this is sort of a way to um, enable like a large multifamily site where, you know, let's say a portion of the slide is on, has 30% slopes or something, then that can be included in the overall development area. So it, it may on some, especially larger multifamily sites in the urban areas, it may allow for um, some additional units without actually changing the, the rezoning parcels. So that's kind of the intent of it. And the intent is also to, you know, even though we it would be included in the overall um, density calculations for the site, we would still continue to apply existing protections such as not developing repairing corridors. So we continue to protect those areas that would just on some sites allow for additional units to be constructed. So, and I guess this can't, maybe doesn't need to be answered now, but just to be thinking it through for the future. And I don't know how many sites like this exist, but if you had an acre site and 70% of it was on a 30% slope, you would still be able to count that 70% or what the 30% the would be the developable area. Um, I mean, I think that there are probably situations that need a little bit more nuance, um, right? So I guess I'm, I'm thinking about it in that way, but I do appreciate that we're at least um, limiting the, the development on slopes. I think that there's a lot of reasons not to do that and um, for safety and all sorts of things. Um, so anyway, that's just something to think about um, going forward. And um, quickly, quickly, I'm just gonna yeah. jump in here. I did hear back from CTV and they're okay with going till 12. Awesome, thank you okay. CTV. 
Um, and then I actually had a similar question um, about on page 11 about the density bonus um, that, that Tim brought up. And um, so I think you answered that. So thank you very much. Um, so, okay, then there was another part in here that I'd have a question on again about open space where it says open space requirements for multifamily RM districts have been clarified requiring both private and public open space, lowering the overall open space area required on some sites. Um, so I guess at some point I'd like a little bit more explanation about what that really means in reality. I am, I am not opposed to the RF zone and I support higher densities. I think open space and design are gonna be critical, even more critical the higher densities you go up. And it can be done. Um, I've seen excellent designs at high density. In fact, some, one from Tim's group. Um, so it can be done. So, but I think th these things are critical and to make the units um, desirable, uh, open spaces is, is also has to be part of that mix. Um, Sorry, I'm just going through here. Um, okay, I did have a question on page 12 to about SB 478, um, which says applies to parcels in the county within census designated places and zone districts that allow multifamily housing or mixed use development. <laughs> Again, this doesn't have to be now, but it would be great to have a map of where those places are um, in one of the next study sessions. And then I had some other, there was, um, okay, I'm sorry here, I should have gotten my questions more organized like I sometimes do. Um, so I, I had some some questions on Exhibit B. Um, you know, some of them are related to topics we're going to get to later. Um, so I wasn't sure if I should talk about them now, except I am actually going to be missing the study session on ag uses. So um, I think I do want to just quickly go through them. On page 41, when we talk about agricultural service established, can we have a definition of that? And maybe that is already defined somewhere that I haven't read yet in the voluminous materials, um, but that would be helpful to know exactly what we're talking about there. Um, on page 43, the temporary events and weddings section, this is a, a, a big one. Um, and I think we'll have a lot of interest um, in the third paragraph under temporary events and weddings, talking about standards and limitations for commercial weddings. Do we wanna also broaden that to events when we're, I mean, that's one of the questions I had. Are we talking specifically only for weddings or are we, you know, including other commercial party type events be like, you know, bar mitzvah or whatever. It might be um, helpful just to clarify that. And then I won't go into the specifics yet um, here, but I think there are probably some things that um, I'd like changed in going forward in the future. Um, well, specifically, I'll just mention um, notification to adjacent properties, I think will need to be greater than 500 feet. And maybe another rubric would be more appropriate than, than a feet, because a lot of these are in rural areas where parcels are far apart and 500 feet might not even capture the next um, house over. But knowing this was a big issue in our district and part of the reason why it's in here actually. So um, the situation I'm thinking of, um, the adjacent property owners were a lot farther, that were impacted by the commercial weddings were uh, a lot farther away than 500 feet. I'm almost done. 
Okay, and then um, on page 47 of Exhibit B, um, now we're talking about um, procedure. And this is all new and it's very exciting. I'm bringing this up now because again, I'm gonna miss the study session where we're gonna dig into this. Um, where we're talking about zoning clearance. Who's gonna be doing the review? What's What would be the equivalent of that um, to our process now? That would be helpful for me to know. And then also is the zoning clearance, um, is that appealable or is that just the appealable elements start at the minor use or site development permit, which is a, um, equivalent to our level three. Okay, I think that that's it. Oh wait, one more, hold on. Nope, that's it. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for all your work. I'm, um, you guys have put so much work into this. I'm trying my best to keep up. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Chairman Gordon. Yes, please. Um, could I say one more thing? Yes. Um, my comment was specifically about the um, general plan about the uh, built environment that we've just reviewed. But I had quite a few, I guess I missed the fact that we are, we didn't get into today the county code amendments. Is that something we're going to be coming up next week, next session? It's session on July 13th. Okay, good. Because like Commissioner Dan, I, I have a lot of issues to discuss there. And I just want, and then I had to step out of the room for a minute and I heard she was bringing up a few things. So good. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, Renee. I, I'm actually going to miss that study. Oh, session. Okay. So I was trying to sneak in my, oh, okay. some of my questions yeah. early. <laughs> okay, that, that'll, that's very specific stuff. And I think we'll all have comments. There, and I certainly have some. So, okay, just clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the where we go over specific code changes, that's going to be on the 13th because I had a lot of questions there too. So I'm going to push a lot of those off till that date. If that's the case. Just to be really clear. Um, if I could just add a comment. Yeah. Um, today's study session did include part of focus on certain code amendments, such as you know development standards for residential and commercial districts. So I think it, you know, it's probably appropriate to discuss this here, but at the um, later study session this month, we will be talking about um, code modernization and, and sort of the review processes and, you know, site development permits, that sort of thing. So we'll be, you know, you can also ask questions there as well, but um, part of today's session did include those sort of development standards. And let me just say, I really appreciate that. It's, um, it's, you know, I, I appreciated that. So, and I appreciate that you allowed me to ask these questions early. <laughs> I was going to chime in on that topic too, and I still will. I didn't know you were going to not be there, but thank you. I understand, Annie. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Lazenby, did you want uh, to ask any questions or further comment? Well, I uh, thank you, Chair. I think uh, Commissioner Dan covered a lot of the things that I had questions about, but there was also a picture in the first segment of this uh, discussion. The last, the last slide showed uh, several different models of the possible buildings, and there were lots of shaded areas. My concern is in three story or four story building in residential areas, infill, for example, that would you require, would the county require the shading um, study to be included in that? Uh, Lizanne, that's an existing requirement, and there's also state law that addresses it. Yes, it's one of the design review requirements that um, shadow studies be provided. <clears throat> so uh, 
that would be something for any project that requires design review, we would also be looking at shadow studies. Uh, we do have the ability to waive that requirement if there was no obvious impact. For example, it was next to some playing fields or something like that, but um, that would always be something we would require if there was a potential to shade neighboring residential properties. Okay, and the, um, the height um, that's allowed on some of the buildings, the, um, I'm looking back, the, um, the hospital up to 60, hospital and medical up to 60 feet in height, four stories, am I correct in that? Yes. And the act, Activity center, 40 feet. Commercial in general is would be at 40 feet. Okay, and would that, would that be true even if it was in a residential area? The, the zoning for that area had been residential and you could still rezone that infill property or parcel to have a 40 foot height um, the standard for commercial is generally 35 now, so it's a five foot increase. Um, but the also there was an ex a section that had an exemption that allowed you to go to five feet anyway. Um, so we just think this is pretty, this is cleaner. Just make it 40 feet, get rid of that exemption part. And then, um, so it's not, it's not actually a big change because a lot a lot of um, commercial entities might have used it anyway, that exemption. If, uh, if I could just quickly chime in, having processed a few of these commercial projects, the 35 foot height limit really isn't enough to allow for a development with a commercial lower floor and residential above. The commercial ceiling heights are generally considerably higher than residential. And um, in the presentation, I know that the three-story residential height would be maintained at 35. But the, we almost always have to do the exception for the commercial projects anyway. So um, as Stephanie says, this is being added just to basically make these projects feasible without having to ask for exceptions. Right, thank you. But would you put a commercial, commercially zoned parcel in a residential area and it wouldn't affect the height? Is, am I correct in that? You could have a situation where um, a residentially zoned parcel wanted to rezone as commercial in order to do a commercial development. Um, frankly, we're not seeing a lot of that these days. It's exactly the opposite. But um, uh, I think for any individual rezoning proposal, we probably would take a look at the context um, and the area. Did it, you know, are they trying to provide a local neighborhood service that makes sense on a corner, perhaps? Um, really would depend on the individual place. Okay, but the... Um I guess another question is these designated areas, the 23 that um, I think in total, would the county be driving the rezoning and paying for the rezoning if there is a charge for the county? The 23 parcels are included in this project. This is a county project. Okay, but would it be up to the developer to apply for a rezoning? No, the rezoning is part of this project. Okay, thank you. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the questions. And um, I've got about 20 minutes here, so I'll try and breeze through it. I'm not gonna have a lot of questions. Um, so, Let's just get started. I do want to again extend a thank you to everyone who's worked on this. I know it's you know a lot of the planning department's team, a lot of other people, in, including some consultants, are a lot of people working on this. And so, I just want to thank everyone for the the energy that's gone into this, and looking forward to moving it along. I had a few uh, general questions, and then just some you know 
some comments and some ideas, and I'm hoping we can um, resolve a few things here. Um, and again, you know, I have some really sp more specific things that I, I might just write to everyone about um, in the interest of time and, and give, you know, planning staff the opportunity to think about it before having to come up with some stuff on the fly. So, um, but I'll just get started. Are there any, first question is, are there any form-based zoning opportunities in this plan? Andy, do you wanna take that? Um, sure, so originally, for example, we had proposed like no density standard for mixed use, but then looking into state law in more detail and discussing with county council, the state does require that we establish density and intensity standards for each zone. So, so that's why, um, you know, we have the new FAR, for example, for commercial um, zones so that we can, um, you know, comply with state law. Um, you know, the intention of these, these standards was to, you know, accommodate development that's allowed, ensure there's space for parking. Um, so, so we did, you know, do research in establishing these standards, but, um, but we are, um, you know, part of the intent is to comply with California state law regarding those requirements. You're saying, so the state law says that we have to provide a density. Um, I see this kind of form-based zoning in other jurisdictions. And um, even if there's a density, it's typically really high. So it kind of aligns with the form that's allowed. And, you know, to make sure everyone's really clear on any of the members of the public or commissioners, it's really a, a setup where a, a parcel is given certain height requirements, setbacks, and other like general requirements. And as long as it meets those, then the density is uh, can be much higher inside that building. So you're still controlling the form with, without uh, regulating how many units that you can put in there. And what that does is really creates an opportunity for smaller units, uh, more units uh, in a single space affordable by design. You still have to meet parking, you still have to meet the other requirements, um, but it can get a little bit of a higher unit count and oftentimes pencils a lot better. So, um, is there any opportunity to look at that a little further and add something like that in or adjust what we have to create those opportunities where appropriate? I'm not saying they're appropriate everywhere, but in certain locations on corridors and things like that, and where it's walk, we're trying to create these walkable neighborhoods, it could make sense. Um, the, the proposed general plan and standards don't anticipate that, but widening the range of the densities allows in, in each of the urban zones allows more flexibility to actually meet those numbers. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but we, we typically aren't seeing um, development yet that is trying to exceed the densities that are in place now, um, uh, except in, you know, in some cases where we have affordable housing developer, which we've talked about, um, well, we could have uh, closer to the upper range. Um, but, but actually, in the past few years, we've had to push on developments to make sure they're meeting the minimum range in our general plan. So it's like setting the floor and we've actually have modif had applicants have to modify their proposal, um, including one the planning commission just looked at to actually meet that minimum density. Um, so, uh, uh, and I will say that the, the form part of it, I think we've tried very hard and worked with a design company, Meg, to address in the county design guidelines. Um, so, if it if the commission wanted to make a change, I I think um, some standards potentially could be removed to to create that. But I'm not sure if the community as a whole <laughs> would um, would want to see that again. The balancing act, you know, that we talked sure. about before. Well, I appreciate that. And I totally understand the balancing act. It's tough. It's kind of like, you know, it's it's growing pains. It's going through that, you know, like we have to do it though. 
not like you can just like not have growing pains when you grow up, right? It happens. You just deal with it and then you grow and you get, and it gets better. And I think we're in that stage right now. And just generally we have this opportunity to look at the next 20 years and to really make a plan that works not just for today, but the future. And some of these principles look like kind of feel like they're, a, you know, not as much of a step forward as we could take as some of the callers mentioned also. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying about the other, you know, the form being restricted in other ways. And that was one question that I brought up last time about the FAR being a 1.0. So, you know, I did some case studies to see how this would actually work. And it seems like they generally align, but it does really end up with all of our de developments looking like they do in the in the design um, in the design guidelines sheet, where it's a building in the front and parking in the back. And you know, this has a few challenges that kind of directly are opposite to other parts of what we're saying in this general plan update. Like there's some sections that say we are, you know, we are trying to um, uh, create. Um, podium style projects. Sorry, I don't know that was hard to get out. Um, and really this kind of design guideline doesn't really allow for that. It allows for the parking in the back and the building in the front. And so we're creating more of a car centric and yeah, uh, design, I think generally across the board than we would have otherwise been able to if we had higher FARs. So I, I would like to look at that and see if there's an opportunity to adjust these affairs. I know it would be a challenge, but you know, we get one shot at this in 20 years and it took 10 years to get here. I feel like we got to really make sure we're getting set up for the future. And it feels a little bit like we're not quite there yet. Um, Commissioner Gordon, if I can just make yes. a brief comment. We, Please. In, in buried in the details, we do exclude parking um, areas from FAR. So if they wanted to tuck under parking, for example, that wouldn't count towards FAR. So we are trying to encourage, you know, various options for parking. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. I appreciate that. In a three-story model with a 1.0 FAR at the max, you're, you'll, and there's a lot of things that preclude parking on the ground floor commercial on the street side, right? So you would have to park behind still commercial mm -hmm. on the front. It just becomes really cost prohibitive. So this is kind of like one of the other questions leads into another question that I had is, have we taken the time to have um, a consultant or someone, you know, members of the development community and design community kind of chime in on this general plan outside of just the community meetings. And to really look, to clarify a little bit, to really look at like, do these projects pencil as planned right now? It's, I think that's the most important thing. We say we're not getting enough developers building enough housing. It's a, it's a financial thing, right, for developers. So if the project doesn't make money, they're not going to develop. That's just, you know, just how it is. Same thing like we all do with our money. If you put it in stocks, you don't put it in there with the idea that you're going to lose money every time. You know, you don't, you don't put the money where it's going to get lost. So, you know, with developers and encouraging them to develop more properties, if we can not just make it denser because it solves the housing crisis, but also create a product that people will want to come build. That's an, it's an important part of it. It's more than just aesthetics. It's also the financial side. So I guess back to my question, have we had anyone look at this from a financial standpoint and say like, yes, if I was going to go buy a property today, I could develop to these standards and it would work. Um, we did work with a uh, Matthew Thompson, a local architect, when we developed our ResFlex standards. We did work closely with him, and he um, provided a lot of examples he's worked on and other local examples in terms of developing the, the development standards um, and that, that sort of thing. Um, and in terms of commercial, um, for example, when we worked on the Pleasure Point plan, we did um, have an economist um, working with us um, in terms of thinking about standards that made sense for commercial. And um, we applied a lot of those concepts to the um, design guidelines for commercial. Okay. Did anything add, Stephanie? I was just going to add that um, that process also included a lot of stakeholders um, and groups uh, from the community. And so a lot of that 
um, work really uh, uh, fed the design guidelines that you have before them. And so um, again, it's, while maybe there wasn't an immediate meeting, this has been, you know, a long-term development o over time. And I just also add, because I was here for the sustainability plan in 2014, and we had a working group, and the working group had a number of architects and designers on that, and this plan kind of, anyway, I just thought I'd add that in, but I, I appreciate this discussion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, totally understand it. You know, I'll, I'll give you a real world example, like where we're at today, the 35 unit project um, in Oakland on 8,500 square foot. It's a different jurisdiction, right? It's a different zone. It's about 170 units an acre or something like that. That is challenging to make it work. That's how hard it is right now to develop projects. It's expensive because of COVID. It's expensive because land's expensive. It's ex just overall really expensive. And so if we don't create guidelines that promote the ability for people to actually develop, it's not gonna happen. And so what was set up for, and I now I'm kind of like correlating with where the affordable housing part of it come in, they can, you know, affordable housing developers can often there's requirements around project size. It doesn't work under a certain number of units. So they're going to do those bigger projects. That's really all that works, right? And just because they're nonprofit or affordable housing developers doesn't mean that it still also needs to make money. And so there's, you know, stakeholders from private investors. There's banks that look at every single project. There's such a huge financial aspect to everything that we're putting in place right now. And I don't feel like it matches with the existing state of the economy. Maybe in 2014, it could have, you could see that. But today in 2022, out of my experience, it's not. And so I guess my question and request would be, you know, before I could really see myself being on board with where we're at is to have someone look at this, you know, from a development standpoint to say, yes, this works. And that's what other jurisdictions have done when they've gone through general plan updates. It's not a crazy ask. I think that it's just something that, especially in today's economy, is really important. Well, I have to, I, I just have to agree with Commissioner Dan. There was quite a bit of in, input. There was a working group. This has had extensive public testimony, and I think it works. Great. I appreciate well, that opinion. Absolutely. Tim, were you speaking of just for the, the proposed new RF zone district or just like in general for the changes with the, the multifamily district as well? Like, yeah, I think. Uh, I think this represents what was asked for and discussed in the past. Um, I don't quite understand that response, Commissioner Shepard. I apologize. but in I interrupted you anyway, so I'll just keep on, let you go okay. on. I know you have a lot to say. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dan, I'm sorry. Can you ask that again? No, I, I was just asking, were you wanting okay. that for the RF district to see, like, to make sure that pencils out given the height and other FAR restraints? Is that what you're asking? I would say that we, sh yes, and um, the new commercial zones, mixed use and, and high res multifamily. I mean, really I, I think that's a good idea. There's so many variables with development. It's it's difficult, right? Like if it pencils out today, well, it, maybe it'll pencil out better in five years because of who knows what, right? I mean, I think it's right. good information to have. Um, and of course you look at things in a different way, which is, which is helpful. Um, so yeah, I would be opposed to that. I just wanted clarity. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I will say that, um, during the community workshops, we we did have the affordable housing community tell us that the density was too low. Um, and also I think uh, uh, we had one member of the public, Alex, who kind of spoke to the floor area ratio um, being too low. The affordable housing folks were pretty much saying a minimum of 60 units per acre um, would 
really be necessary to meet the goals and make projects um, more feasible. We, we discussed the reason for not doing that and giving the density bonus um, program um, the, uh, the place in our development to, to really bring in those more affordable units. Um, uh, but, but we did have, we cert we did have that feedback and I, I, uh, we don't have that community here today. I don't think, um, so I just, for those who may not have heard that, those comments, I wanted to, um, uh, let you know, they were, they were out there. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I did read that. And that's kind of one of the, why the red flag went up, you know, if it, you know, that's a big development community that we're hearing that we're not, it's not dense enough, you know, to make it work. So if it doesn't work for state funded affordable programs that really like apply for money and, you know, how's it going to work for the average developer who doesn't have that bench of, of, of cash or background of projects or, you know, a lot of people in this town don't, aren't, that have these properties that are potentially going to be upsound, aren't necessarily like professional developers, if you will. They have a piece of property that they want to do something with, you know, and they need that help and raising those funds is tough. And we're talking about millions of dollars to like develop a single project that people have to come up with in cash. So it's just like really a lot more challenging and more expensive than anyone really, you know, kind of thinks about until you really get into it. So, um, okay, thank you for that. I have a couple other questions. I can I can move on from that point, although it might kind of just naturally come back up. Um, uh, let's see. I apologize. I might fumble a little bit here, just getting back on track. Uh, with the design guidelines, I just really a little unclear is the are these guidelines or are they rules? Like are is this something that someone in the planning and what's the process? Does someone in the planning department review each one of those guidelines as the project gets submitted? Is it a group of people that's always the same? What's that process going to look like? Guidelines are are more concepts and guidance than rules. So um, they work in tandem with the code that has more the objective standards um, and the guidelines with the, all the pictures and examples and concepts are meant to um, help both our planners and developers understand how you can get there. Um, we didn't wanna make them overly prescriptive um, to allow flexibility and um, some design creativity. So different concepts there. Um, generally, the guidelines should be consulted by any developer on a project and the planner who's assigned to reviewing the project would um, look at the design guidelines for consistency. And certainly as we are uh, uh, introducing these new guidelines to the development community um, would probably have more of a team of people looking at them from, from our policy folks. For instance, Annie, who's um, done so much work on these and um, has, has worked with uh, our design consultants who developed these and the pleasure point guidelines and back to the SSCC. So um, uh, I think until we get everybody kind of up to speed, there'd be more of a team of people that are looking at, at projects. I'm sorry, and Tim, I just wanted to jump in here. Um, I received a second email from CTV saying that because their operator was able to take a break during the presentation, that they're actually good to go on beyond noon to probably up to about 1.30. So if we want to keep going, I think we can. Um, we don't have to stop, but it's coming up 12 now. So I just wanted yeah, to let you know. Thank you so much. And I'm, uh, you know, take the poll here. I know we, you know, it's been a few hours, so we could take at least a five minute break or, you know, here in a minute to let people get a drink, use the restroom, that kind of thing, or we can move on either way. Yeah. Yeah. I'd prefer to keep going. Okay. I have a <laughs> one. Okay, understood. I see that. Great. Um, Okay, so okay, um, I'm leaving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. See you next meeting.
Yep, sounds great. Um, he was talking about design guidelines, and I appreciate that. You know, it's going to take a team effort. Um, it's kind of a, a balance between what we want to control and what we can control, and what the state's controlling, and, and all kinds of things, right? And like how we want our our county to look. Um, I understand that it's challenging. I just wonder a couple of things regarding this. You know, there's some specific things that require neighborhood context to be taken into place. And I see this in a lot of jurisdictions and I take a lot of pause with it and because it's challenging, because it's very subjective. And so where we see a lot of cost challenges and projects and time challenges more specifically, which relate to cost is subjectivity uh, in the process. And so I wonder if that's, you know, something that would, we would want to clarify more, or, you know, if I understand that it's pretty, you know, the process is such that someone couldn't design something poorly, I assume, but then it, I guess I have a lot of questions here. I apologize, not very succinct. Are we going to make it challenging on people to develop what they want to? For example, I don't see much uh, in the way of like flat roofs. Are those not allowed now? Is that the plan? Um, if so, like I could show you many buildings in Santa Cruz that are beautiful, aesthetically pleasing flat roof structures. And so this is the inherent problem in the subjectivity of neighborhood context where someone says one thing, someone says the other thing, and like, where do you end? Um, and it's put a, a lot of problems, you know, significant time delays on projects of ours specifically. So is there a solution there that works a little better? Is there like a limit to the number of iterations that can be asked to be made? Is there, um, you know, is there a pre-meeting where design aesthetic is decided first and upfront? Is there some way to fix this or make it a little bit easier and faster for people that go to develop? And I think um, I'll stop I, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of um, like what sort of design styles are allowed, the, the design styles, the design guidelines are definitely intended to be flexible and allow modern designs, traditional designs, and there's not an expectation that you match the design style necessarily of an adjacent site. Um, so, so they are intended to be flexible and the guidance is more about like appropriate transitions where you might have, you know, um, modulated building fronts, but, but the, the intention is that we allow flexibility in terms of design. Um, and um, in terms of pre-development, we do have a process and Lausanne could probably speak to that in more detail, but we do have certainly have an option to do a pre-development consultation for projects where they can, you know, get some initial feedback and input before they design their project. Sure. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And I appreciate that. Um, I think if we could really clarify somewhere in there, that's like, it's, it's suggestions, it's not requirements. I, Cause that gets tricky and you know, there's a project that I brought to this commission that had done all those steps. And Rachel mentioned it earlier. Another commissioner at the time mentioned that it looked like something along the lines of it looked like it fell from outer space <laughs> and voted no. You know, that kind of, that is the reality of how it feels to be a developer coming to this commission, going through this process, feeling the risk of like, they could just say no because they just don't like it. And then those millions of dollars that I just spent are literally down the drain. And so that's the, the where I'm coming from is like, I'd really like to help the community and those who are going to develop in these ways to like feel comfortable that like they can work through this process and get here and like not feel scared or be set up appropriately so that their project is correct, you know, that kind of thing. That's the background, um, and yeah. Yeah, just just one more comment with um, some of the legislative efforts that are coming down from the state. Um, there's really a move to get away from non-objective standards, um, and so that the language, um, both in the introductory material of the guidelines as well as the 
a code section in 1311 that really ties in the guidelines um, does does talk about kind of consistency with the concepts. Um, so that is that is um, specifically written in in both those those sections. Okay. Maybe I, I actually was going to ask about design stuff too, but I didn't. And so I appreciate Tim that you brought this up because so I guess I'll just say two things. One, um, though, I think in the 15 years I've been on this commission, there have been lots of comments about design. I can't remember a single time somebody ever voted against a project because they didn't like the design. But 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 I understand it's a real concern. Um, and then I'd also say maybe we could just have, and maybe this is part of the reason why this concern came up was a lot of the photos in the presentations have been of a specific style, kind of, I don't even know what you call it, but like the general, same kind of general style. But if there's a way to maybe have some examples that fit, you know, the the design su suggestions, guidelines that are a, a completely different um, style that might be helpful, give, give, you know, developers a little bit more comfort, like, okay, I can have something come in that's more modern. And, and I would just say, yeah, flat roofs should be part of that because if you, in some cases, you can make the roof um, an outdoor space, which is a great idea, I think. Um, especially if we're going to get more dense, we have to figure out creative ways to, um, you know, to have more outside space. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to support that, those lines of comments there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes, absolutely. And one other thing to add, and I've seen this in other jurisdictions, is when the design guidelines are made, there's a, there's this, um, you know, not just the verbiage, but a, a picture showing, okay, you need articulation every 10 feet. Here's kind of what that looks like. Here's what we expect. One thing that I wasn't clear on reading through is, are windows considered articulation for the purposes of these design guidelines? And, you know, if it's not really super clear what we mean, people are just going to have a lot of questions and it's going to be challenging. So I think you don't have to do that everywhere, but in some scenarios, it might make sense to really um, to clarify with some, some drawings. Um, great. Thank you. Um, some more specific questions here. Are, are townhomes going to be allowed in the R1 zone? I know a lot of this is pushing towards smaller um, smaller properties for R1 districts. I don't believe townhomes are always allowed in the R1 or maybe not allowed at all. I think there's a little bit of ambiguity between general plan and zoning standards on that. But I just want to be really clear if if a lot of those pictures, again, back to the pictures like Commissioner Dan mentioned, a lot of those are connected like townhome style buildings. So just wondering if that's a change or something that'll happen. Annie, do you have a thought on, um, on no, that? I, I, I'm sorry, I actually need to check that. I can, I can look at that while we're talking and um, get back to you. Um, Okay. No problem. And, um, yeah, actually, like yes, I, I can answer right now. Um, single family attached units are allowed in R1 zone districts. So yes, they could be. Single family attached, are, are they allowed currently or that's a change? Um, right now, um, <clears throat> there is a rule. Right, right now we allow semi-detached dwellings where you share one wall uh, that's on the property line with an adjacent in um, the R14 and smaller zone districts. So I'm not sure how it's changing, but that's the current regulation. Yeah, it would be changing to basically allow attached single family, which basically means townhomes in, in all the residential districts. Good, great. I think that's a really good option and it allows, especially like the sites like Commissioner Dan was saying, where a lot of it's not buildable or, um, you know, you want to focus it in a single spot, getting rid of this, this side yard is a really good way to really compact that a little bit and it matches a lot of the aesthetic. So thank you. One thing I'm really not clear on is the RF design guidelines. And I've been, you know, kind of searching all the docs and I didn't see a specific RF zone design guideline in the 
120 page design guideline packet. And so I'm, I maybe it's just me. I'm just not really seeing where those are at. And so I wonder if someone can help clarify where that is or if it is part of another section of the design guidelines. Um, yes, there actually, there's not a separate um, section for residential flex because it is basically another type of multifamily housing is just a, a higher, you know, intensity and density of development. So, so it's, it's the same concepts that apply to in the multifamily chapter and the overarching chapter, the design guidelines would also apply to ResFlex. There are a few um, places in the design guidelines where it specifically addresses ResFlex, such as, um, you know, since the open space provisions allow for both private and common open space, it encourages, you know, open space, common open space and larger sites. Um, there's some specific guidance in the design guidelines for you know, multi-multi corridors where you might want to have the open space in the middle of the site where there's more traffic that isn't specifically about ResFlex, but it might apply, you know, more often to ResFlex where you might expect that type of housing to be located. Um, but there's not a separate chapter for ResFlex sites. Okay. And so to be clear, it's on the, it relates to the multifamily and not the mixed use zone? Correct. I mean, if it was, we do have mixed use as well. So, um, but ResFlex is a residential, so yes, he'd be applying the multifamily standards. Residential. To only. So does that mean those properties on Portola that are getting changed are going to residential only with no commercial ground floor? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, but the, the mix is more in the neighborhood, right? At the neighborhood level rather than on a particular site. Okay. I guess I, I'm trying to think about this and I think other commissioners might have asked as well. It's hard to understand all of these new uh, zones or changes to the current zones without understanding like where they apply. So in my mind, RF with you know maybe missing this somewhere in this that it was either a mixed use or you know I assumed it was a mixed use, but maybe that I was clearly wrong. So then I'm wondering like, are we actually applying a lot of non-mixed use zones to commercial corridors, is that going to happen all the way down Portola? You know, that kind of a thing makes me think through what we're allowing for these zones differently. And so is there a way to like clarify what, where these will actually be applied or the plan for that? Beyond, um, beyond being able to map where the multimodal corridors are, talking about where those corridors are, um, uh, we don't have a kind of a specific plan for this parcel, this parcel, this parcel beyond what you're seeing um, in the map amendments that we reviewed. However, I will say that um, next year, as we work through our housing uh, element update and the arena, we really are going to have to be looking at sites that are intensified for residential use. And that work is is uh, immediately followed up with potential um, and proposed re rezoning in order to meet the arena. So at that point, you would see kind of a grander plan um, right. of where those could be. Um, suffice it to say, it's it is in along the corridors and it is in the USL, and that's why we talked a lot about the framework sure. uh, earlier. Okay. I get the general principle. One question I had that kind of relates to this is. In the presentation, you mentioned that the, the density for mixed use projects was 45 units an acre, but if it's if the RF zone is not a mixed use project, then from everything else I've seen, commercial mixed use is only 30 units an acre. Right, Sorry. this is a change. The um, uh, Right now it's actually the high density, um, density range, so 17.4 units per acre for mixed use. Uh -huh. um, so now we would allow it up to 45 units per acre, acre on a mixed use site. And um, because of the shifts we're seeing away from the brick and mortar commercial that we talked about, um, and based on some past examples, um, the code would also change to allow up to 75% of the site 
to be used for residential. So that's a that's a shift as well. Right. And okay, that's so, on in our commercial zones. Okay, that makes sense. So it's as the way our county code is now is that if I have a commercial mixed use project, it defers the density if I do a mixed use project to the RUH zone, right? And right. what you're saying is that it will now defer to the RUH Act. Or yes, base, yeah. basically, yes. Okay, so the zone itself might not change. It'll still be a mixed use zone. It just kind of defers the density. Okay, that makes sense. So we will see higher densities than 30 on these on the corridors, essentially. It's not 30 now. It's 17.4 now. Um, there are there are density bonuses that could come into play where you can get higher, but that's the that's the kind of base standard at this time. Right, 17 now, but isn't the RUH changing to 30 at the maximum? Right, so that would be a change as well. But mixed use would refer to the 45 units per acre. Okay, that clears a lot up. Thank you, I didn't quite understand that. Um, okay. Um, So I think I just want to talk a little bit about the guidelines um, in a little more detail, or I could also, like I said, just kind of write this out and give everyone time to digest because I've got probably like 25 comments on the code section. And so if that works for everyone, I, I can do that instead and just write it all down and send it to everyone. It's all public at that point. Is that correct? Right, writing it down would be okay. I would just caution the commission that you can't have a conversation about it and back and forth uh, via email. It would be a violation of the Brown Act. So if you want to provide the comments, um, that's fine. We'll just want to have any uh, discussion between the commissioners at a public meeting. Correct. So could I, in theory, write down my thoughts and send it to you and you would publish it with the next hearing? Um, yes, in theory, yes, we could do that. Um, we did talk about maybe another meeting in August. Perhaps that would be a good time to collect the comments that we've received and and uh, provide any additional information. Okay. Um, if I could just make a comment, I believe there's also a planning commission hearing that we had considered as a possible, you know, additional meeting on July 27th. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, if, for example, you, you wanted staff to consider code mm. revisions, that might allow a little more time before returning for public hearing. So that's another option. I think we should talk about that. I know I have a section at the end for a discussion around um, next meetings, but it is important because I will also be out of town on July 13th. So um, Commissioner Dan's out also. I'm out the whole month. Oh, you are? Yeah, great. Um, maybe we can figure out how to make that happen. Um, oh, we have ahead. a schedule that's kind of been directed by the CAO and, and the board. So um, July 27th would probably be the best way to add a meeting in, um, giving us a little bit of time to incorporate any changes in the ordinances before coming back uh, at the second meeting in August. And August 10th, would that be an option as well for any kind of last? I know we're adding two more meetings here, but um, it seems pretty important. Is there an option to add August 10th also? I think that would make it more difficult to return to to get, if work is necessary and analysis is necessary, it'd be a little harder to return and stay on, on the schedule. Yeah. Um, the commission always has the option of adding an, an extra meeting, an interim meeting at any point. It doesn't have to be a regular meeting schedule. My preference would be to, we can talk further, but I would say maybe add both. And is it easy to, you know, if we don't have anything for August 10th and we felt like we've just 
decided or discussed everything, or they're just very minor things. It'd be helpful at least to have the opportunity. Don't we have two public hearings? So we could meet on August 10th, and then anything that comes out of that, if there's work that needs to be done from it, it could just be bumped to the second one. Um, anyway, that's one option. Yeah. But uh, Tim, I think your idea of sending, if, you know, you want to send your comments to staff and staff distribute that to the commission, I think is, is a fine way to do it. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, sounds good. Um, there's just a couple things and then I just, you know, easier to talk through a little bit. And I appreciate we talked about the design guidelines and not having a like specific aesthetic. I, I like that. I know Santa Barbara is a beautiful place, but we're not Santa Barbara. We don't have just one style that we do always. And so I really appreciate you clearing up that, you know, we're not requiring a specific style or aesthetic because I think that's kind of the fabric of Santa Cruz is a little bit um, more eclectic and different, different styles allowed. So um, I there's a couple discrepancies that I saw. One was in particular that we talked a little bit about the, um, you know, requirement or, you know, the um, idea around podium style buildings. Those are typically larger zero lot line style, you know, bigger projects. And it didn't feel like, even though we call that out as kind of a a suggestion or something we'd like to see happen more. It didn't feel like the design layouts as is would really allow for that very often. Um, so just something to think about. We might need to clean, like do some more case studies and clean that up because it does con conflict between the, the plan. Um, and I just want to talk about the kind of some real world examples of some of the um, requirements on the commercial and mixed use. One thing that the mixed use um, commercial requirement had a depth of 45 feet for minimum. And I understand the intent there and we do see this in some jurisdictions, but when we practically applied it to some lots, especially ones that are maybe longer and not deep, which happens often along these corridors, um, it, it can preclude or immediately cause a variance on uh, that kind of a requirement. And so I wonder if we can not make that a requirement, but a suggestion where possible. Um, you know, I, the project I mentioned earlier has a commercial ground floor. If we had a 45 foot requirement in depth, that project couldn't exist. So there's 34 units down the, that we couldn't do because of one commercial requirement. So, um, and maybe I'm missing something, maybe it's not an actual requirement, maybe it is a suggestion, but it does, uh, it can cause challenges to future development. So couldn't you apply for a variance for something like that? Wouldn't that be a great opportunity for a variance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, you know, Commissioner Danny, you've been here a lot longer than me. I'm not sure the stance on variance in a lot of scenarios. My preference well, is- Well, you'd have to make a fine findings and, and right. whatnot, but um, right. anyway, yeah. Yeah, Commissioner, definitely. I'm just, oh, sorry. Someone. No, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, oh, that's were you referring to a standard for the minimum parcel depth? Is that what you're referring to? Or I thought I saw one that was a mixed uh, commercial requirement. That's a lot of information. Forgive me if I didn't get this right. Is I should ask specifically first, is there a requirement of 45 feet or for commercial space in depth? I don't believe so, although possibly I may be missing something. I mean, the in the commercial site and structural dimension chart, there's a minimum parcel frontage required. Um, uh -huh. Let me let me look at that again. I had note of page 71, A19, so of the design guidelines. And if I mess that up, I apologize. And oh, the design guidelines. Okay, yeah. I see. Um, I can take a look at that. Um, 
because I think the intent of some of these is is good. I can see where they're going. Like there's all sorts of reasons why you'd want frontage in front of a commercial, like outdoor seating, for instance. Sure. So I mean, I think it's a good standard to have to, you know, create outdoor spaces, especially if we're going to be densifying. People will need places to go outside of their unit. But for a one-off project, if it's going to make it infeasible, that seems to be a perfect opportunity. Um, for a variance, but so I mean, I guess I see where you're going. I think it's you know that's imp it's important. Um, we don't want to prevent something that would be a benefit to being developed, but at the same time, it might not be good to throw the baby out with the bathwater when, like, in general, it's there to provide other great opportunities. I I found this section. Maybe I can we could just. I can read it and we can clarify that a little bit. Um, it's encourage ground floor office space in a mixed use building to have a depth between 45 and 60 feet where possible multiple smaller offices could be created in favor of a single large office space. I, and I think the intent there is not to just have these teeny little commercial facades along a street, but actually have it be a real uh, a real thing and that's why that depth is encouraged but that's not a lot a lot depth. that's the commercial space on the ground floor and if, okay oh, go if ahead. i can just add a oh sorry no please thank you i would say if i can add a comment to that as well the the um guidance in the design guidelines is is generally phrased like uh, stephanie read like encourage or so so these are more qualitative and there's not a variance required, for example, there's language that if, you know, a, a different design provides a superior outcome that can be considered. So, so see, these, these are more guidelines and not a hard and fast standard if it's, if it's only in the design guidelines and not recording in our, stopped, not in our um, um, county code standards. Um, I'm going to pause everybody for one second there to make sure we got the recording going again. Yeah, recording in progress. Recordings back. <laughs> okay, there we go. Great. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, you're, you said that uh, there are often suggestions and better design um, could be shown and uh, could, uh, you know, um, move past something like this. Section A19 was where I got caught. It does say ensure ground floor retail uses in a mixed building have a depth of 45 feet. And um, I definitely understand what Commissioner Dan's saying and, and what you're all saying about, uh, you know, variance or the ability to make adjustments. Um, it is one of those things that if it looks like a hard and fast rule, you do have to do the variance or concession or waiver or something like that. And it doesn't seem like that's the intent of what we're going for because we do understand that some parcels aren't as deep or whatever. Um, and I, uh, I agree that the, the better retail depth, you know, deeper retail depth is, is you know, always going to create a better project. You can get more along the face instead of maybe one long one, you have more uh, that are deeper. Um, but it just can be a challenge from a project standpoint. So, so. I think the only other thing that I really like want to talk in person about and and get a little bit more in, into is and something we've talked a little bit about already is just the you know the FAR and the just style of development that we're proposing for our county and it to me feels you know a little bit car centric it's you know we have an opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with less parking, you know, denser projects around specific nodes where there's, you know, housing and commercial elements that, you know, creates the opportunity to have walkable environments, um, reduces traffic overall, creates more livable communities. And I just don't inherently agree that this plan that we have is there yet. And I think it can be, but having, you know, a property with a third of it for housing or commercial use and two thirds of it for parking is really just, you know, doesn't really promote those things in a way that I feel like we 
we should as a as a county. And like I said, and we all know, ten years to get here, and twenty years from now, we're going to look back and and you know see where this went. But we see a lot of other jurisdictions where you know they're they're doing the zero lot lines, even though it's painful. They're they're adding the height. They're upping the FAR, or they're doing the form based density. You know where it matters because housing is such a big deal. Greenhouse gas emissions are such a big deal. And we've heard from a few community members today that we're not doing enough. And I, you know, I, I tend to agree with them. And I just don't think I could support this yet where it is because of those reasons. I think to get there, I'd need, you know, higher FAR or no FAR. I, I like the idea of the front setback you know, in commercial buildings and not having that zero lot line because a lot of our um, sidewalks are already kind of pretty narrow. And so it gives a little relief and it feels like a community space. But then when you also take it, you remove the ability to build further back, it, you know, it limits what we can do. So, you know, I'd like to see maybe lower setbacks on commercial corridors. Um, Higher densities would be really beneficial. Another story would obviously be really beneficial. Um, Form-based zoning, if we could do it, as I talked about. And then, you know, there's a few of the guidelines that I think are going to be really restrictive, and we should talk about those after I kind of send that list. Things like um, requiring every residential unit to plant a tree in their front yard. You know. A cool aesthetic, but we're in the drought right now. And we are planting trees where it's now gonna grow and shade solar access when you know that's kind of going the other way for development where it's being required to promote solar access for all electric buildings. Um, and so I think there's just some clarifying things like that that I will wanna wanna dig into. And then my other comments, like I already mentioned, if we could get some financial feasibility of these plans, I think that would help us all understand whether or not this plan can actually work for us as a community. And then, you know, on the design guidelines, you know, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of outreach to um, community members. And it sounds like we had done some to the design community in particular, but I'd really love to see if there's other designers, you know, in the community that we could specifically reach out to and say, hey, what do you think? Like, let's get some input from people that are going to actually implement and um, and make sure that it works. So a lot of things there. Happy to talk about any of it further. I think you, you all have the gist of what I'm, what I'm getting at. But, um, where I'm at today. And if I need to help kind of clarify any action items, I can do that because I know it's kind of a bit of a ramble. Maybe, you know, so that these can, um, it might be helpful for all of us to um, meet with staff alone so that we can get some of these very specific questions um, asked privately, and then um, the meetings can go a little bit more quickly. Um, you know, so, you know, for instance, Commissioner Shepard's not here um, to hear what you had to say, um, which I think is probably, you know, um, would be important for all of us to know. We don't have a second district here right now. So, um, you know, thankfully we have a bunch of other meetings. Um, I, I, I have a lot of comments on some of the things you said, but I'm just going to hold off. Um, we can talk about transportation next time. Um, so, okay. And we're not taking any action on this until August. So, No action today. Yep. And, and just to add, I, staff would be happy to meet with commissioners if they have questions on the material. We realize it's a lot. Sometimes things are hard to find. Sometimes we're scrambling even to make sure we're giving you the right 
answer. Um, for instance, we I spent a good hour with uh, Commissioner Shepard yesterday, kind of walking her through things and how to find things and um, where where particular things she was interested in might be located. And so we're, we're happy to, to, to help answer questions to kind of um, um, help everybody kind of formulate their comments and, and, and uh, any changes that they want to see. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm happy to chat with planners directly. I think there's a few questions that in particular that I could have had answered sooner, but I also think that if I can't find it easily, I think the community probably has a challenge to find it easily also. And so um, I just want to, it's a fine balance between helping everyone who's listening also figure this out and then also, you know, not wasting everyone's time. This is also my only opportunity to provide opinion uh, is in these meetings. And so, um, I, you know, I'm just going to use the time as I can. So. Um, anyway, all that said, I don't have any further comments. I'm not sure if any other commissioners would like to follow up with any final thoughts or questions or anything. Sounds like, oh, Commissioner Lazenby, yeah. Okay. Um, you think I'd know how to work this by now. The um, I want to echo the other commissioners' comments about the massive amount of information and the un unbelievable amount of work that has gone into this. I think the, the very basic concept is something that I can approve, but um, I have some specific questions. Just um, one thing on, on the Thurber Lane property, that it was, um, it was, the current land use was multiple and the current zoning was C1PA. But when you go to make a proposed zoning, do you try to do it so that it's most appealable to developers? You know, given the land and the description of it, that it would be most um, attractive to developers? Um, developers and, and the community too, right. right? Meeting community needs. We certainly with a project like this, we're looking at the, the big picture, um, and, uh, we get to, we've included some particular sites because they seem to provide particular opportunities. Um, uh, that property is, uh, d divided uh, approximately the southern third is C1 zoning and the top two thirds are office zoning approximately. And um, what we've envisioned is keeping that zoning line um, and but allowing C2, uh, which allows a little bit more intensification and different, a range of different commercial uh, types. And then the northern part uh, for residential flex, we think a a good um, that property is worth a, a mix of um, potentially providing a commercial aspect and providing that workforce housing that's needed in the medical area. So we really do try to look at it within the context of the the neighborhood, the area. Maybe the if it was in the called out specifically in the sustainable Santa Cruz plan county plan, we look at we look at that too. Um, and uh, developers will come along with certain things. We try to see if those things might make sense. I think there's um, different proposals that could happen on that particular uh, that particular site. Um, but if we if we're looking at the community and we don't think it makes sense, we don't, you know, we're not trying to just get a property developed um, because there's a developer out there when they're trying to do something that doesn't make um, make make sense in the context of the community or or the plan or um, goals, vision, that kind of thing. So it's a, you know, it's that's a, a 
a well-rounded answer, I think, to that to that question. It it may be, and there are times when people want to do things that we don't think is the right thing, and so it's not geared toward that. Okay. And would there be any uh, flexibility as to developers wanting to make two parcels? Um, or yes, a subdivision could be accommodated there. We're okay. we're not we're not doing that as part of the zoning, but that could that could be. Um, and in fact, that that might really be something that's necessary um, because uh, you might have a residential developer on the north side, uh, north part, and maybe some sort of medical building developer or hotel developer or some other kind of commercial developer on the south. And so um, depending on the particular needs of the uh, development, that, that may make sense. Okay, thank you. I think I'm all questioned out. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Um, I just did want to add one final thought on this, and I know I mentioned it, and we've all said how much we appreciate all the hard work, and I just can't say that enough. This is like so complicated. This is such complicated stuff, and it's so much information, and there's uh, so many opinions, and appreciate how well the planning department takes all this information, especially in these hearings, and really like goes through it applies it and figures it out and we've seen it on a lot of other things like ADU program and all this, every everyone that I've been involved with to date and it's been really great to work with you all and appreciate how hard you work at um, making this a really great process so thank you uh, with I don't know if there's any if there's no other questions and I think we can close this part of the uh, hearing and move on um, and um, unless I'm Ms. Hansen if you have anything last minute things to say or anything otherwise we'll move on. I just want to say how much I appreciate the robust discussion and really kind of digging into the concepts and details it helps us um, and helps all of us I think get to a better product so thank you. Great. I appreciate all the all the detailed feedback and it'll be helpful moving forward so thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. We can close agenda item number eight at this time, study session, and move on to the last three items here, planning director's report. Do we have any reports today from the planning director, Ms. Jeff? Um, am I muted? Good, no. <laughs> um, I do see that Matt is, Matt Machado, the is director of uh, the Community Development Division, is here today. Um, so, Matt, um, good afternoon. Uh, do you have anything that you would like to report today? Yeah, thank you. I, I, Lizanne, I think you just called on me. I was getting transitioned over, so my, my sound went uh, quiet for a second. But I just have two quick updates, and I know we're a little long on time today, but um, uh, two important items. One item actually went to the Board of Supervisors yesterday, and it's with regard to our rail trail efforts. And so a number of segments are, are pursuing grant funds for construction. Uh, all segments that are being um, uh, preliminarily designed and going through the environmental process does include multiple alternatives, both the interim trail and the rail and trail combined. Um, I just want to share on segment uh, eight and nine, the city, uh, and we're partners with the city on segment eight and nine, is pursuing a uh, cycle six ATP grant for $32 million, which would build rail and trail. Segments 10 11 is being led by the county. Uh, we're pursuing an ATP grant for cycle six uh, in the amount of 71 million, which would build rail and trail. We also are carrying the interim alternative for the interim trail if uh, the RTC chooses to rail bank. And then uh, segment 12 is being led by RTC with the county as a partner. Uh, they are pursuing um, federal grant. Uh, that's a part of a larger Highway 1 project. The, the entire project is valued at about 200 million and they're pursuing a $30 million federal grant to build and design components of it. So I just wanted to give the commission that update. It's a really critical transportation element, uh, whether it goes interim trail or rail and trail. And uh, I would say that uh, the city, the RTC and the county are working well together to pursue funding to construct. The next update, my last one, is that uh, 
we are pursuing a uh, website update. This website update for the county would combine the Division of Public Works and the Division of Planning together. Uh, it's in uh, phase one, which is kind of a data gathering and trying to figure out what we want it to look like. And then the phase two will be implementation. And so that is underway today. And so uh, I look forward to sharing that with you in the future. And that's it for me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Great, thank you, Matt, appreciate it. Any comments or questions for Mr. Machado? Uh, Commissioner Dan or Lazenby? Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Um, we kind of talked through this a little bit, but is there anything else to report? Um, we do have, in addition to the study session on the upcoming agenda for uh, June 22nd, we have three additional items that will be regularly scheduled items at this time. Um, and then the study session. Um, I'm not sure of the content of the uh, following hearing for July 13th, but I know that we, we will have our study session. I'm not sure whether there's any going to be um, regularly scheduled items along with that as well. Okay. So based on two items plus the study session, that's going to be a long meeting day. Yeah, and there are so actually, there are actually, block it out. there are actually three items. Um, there's a couple of projects and um, providing recommendation regarding conservation open space. So some of these are general plan amendments, um, which is a countywide project. So that's not, that's not an actual development project, but, and then there's the study session as well. And then we have uh, something, it may be coming back on consent, but a report regarding the CKD pile um, dust mitigation that I asked to come back on that date as well. Yes. I'm just saying that maybe um, if Michael could let Commissioner Shepard know, just um, so we could all plan in the second district as well. It's helpful for me to, to be able to know how much time I need to block out. Yeah, this, this, yeah, that's true. The CKD is coming back on the 22nd too. Thanks. Is there an opportunity to get this material sooner? Because this is three projects plus a consent item that I don't know about yet personally, and which I can dig into. Um, and the study session is just a lot of material to get through in three days. Um, I can check up on that. I. As far as I know, we're on schedule to get everything through that is on the agenda, but um, whether there's any chance of getting it earlier, I don't know. Uh, it's quite a tight deadline now. I know that one of the items on the agenda is something that I will be bringing, and um, there's a possibility just because of timing that I might have to defer that to the 13th, but then I know the 13th is also a heavy agenda. We have an appeal item that's coming back coming to your commission on that date. So, and then Tim, I know that you are actually going to be gone. And I think Rachel, you said you were gone during July as well. So a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of deadlines right now. <laughs> yes. I will also be gone on the 22nd. On the tw you're gone on the 22nd. I think Tim and Rachel are gone on the 13th. Okay. So. Yes. Well, we'll keep working through it then. Um, <laughs> got, we have one more one more meeting between now and the 13th. Yeah. You know, if I, there's an opportunity to get some of that material sooner, even I don't know if this is possible, end of the month. Yeah. You know, for the 13th, I can at least review it. I'll be out of town, so I can't get the printouts at that time. So okay. um you know, any, I don't know if that's, that's probably really pushing it for the 13th, but especially for the next hearing, since there is so many things, even two or three days sooner to get the printouts would be really beneficial just because it is really a lot of reading, <laughs> which is fine. Happy to do it, but I run out of time. Sometimes, so. um, I, I will make inquiries and see where we're at and see if that's possible. Okay. Yes, for sure. 
so much. Um, okay, last item on the agenda then is County Council Report. Mr. Zizueta, do you have anything to report today? Hey, good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners. Um, just one suggestion. I think uh, since we're going to do a study session on the 22nd and the 13th, all the materials are online. You might be able to, uh, you know, staff can forward you just exactly what is going to be brought on the 22nd and on the 13th. And it may just be beneficial for you and other commissioners to kind of get ahead of, of that reading because it is a lot. Um, but those, those materials are available um, right now um, by link, you know, not printed out, but I think that might be helpful. Um, and uh, I just want to also say thank you to staff. I know how hard this item is and has been to compile. I mean, it's it's a lot to review. Just imagine writing it. You know, this is it's taken so long, and I know just how hard they're working. Stephanie, Natisha, Annie, um, Daisy, that whole team is just incredible, and they just work really hard on this. And and um, I I know we've been acknowledging them over and over, but it would be remiss for me not to also acknowledge them. And, and you know, I get to see how much hard work they put into this. And in addition to all the other things that they're doing in their roles for the county, um, it's just remarkable. Um, I also have some personal news. So I'm going to be leaving the county um, in a month. July 8th will be my last day with the county. Um, it's a bittersweet departure. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here and working with all of you. Um, it's just uh, an opportunity came along with the city of San Jose, which is where I live. Um, and uh, it was it was too good to pass up. So um, I had to start making plans uh, with my boss and with my, my office here a couple. It's been it's been about a month or so in the making, so I've been trying to give them enough leave time to find some folks. And uh, my colleague Justin Graham will be taking over this chair, this seat, um, this assignment. So you'll be—he uh, he was on today, but he'll be attending um, the next meeting as well. Will be my last meeting, the 22nd, but he will be taking over the July 13th meeting. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's hard to say goodbye and. You know, it's obviously not goodbye forever, but I, uh, I I value your your friendships, your professional relationships with me, and and I look forward to to seeing you all complete this incredible endeavor and and many endeavors to come. So thank you. I will miss you. Yes, I've only worked with you for a little bit, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I'm yeah, oh. we're all going to miss you greatly, Daniel. It's going to be <laughs> won't be the same without you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 tough. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Good luck. Congratulations, Daniel. Thanks. Yeah, it was a really hard decision. Um, sure. I just I just love my office so much, and the team here, and the and the folks I work with are just so fantastic. And and the planning department, I it's really been the best job I've ever had. So it was really really tough to make that decision to go, but um, you know, it was it was something that that needed to be done and. Sometimes you gotta you, you put your family out in front, and uh, that's kind of what it came down to. Yeah, living where you work—that's a no-brainer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Riding my bike. Yeah. Sustainable San Jose, San Jose plan, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Well, uh, good luck with all that, Daniel, and we'll we'll miss you around here. Thank you. Uh, with that, then we have nothing left on the agenda. Made All it. right. We Thank can close you. the hearing for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate Thank, it. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the 22nd. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye.